John, can I?
Can they hear us out there is what my... They should now. Now they should, thank you. Now that the mics are on. All right, guys, so it's now 103. At this time, I cannot start this meeting because we do not have a quorum. So I just want you to sit tight. Let's wait about 15 minutes. If we get a third commissioner in the chambers, we'll be able to start. But as of right now, I cannot start this meeting because we do not have a quorum. Thanks. So I just wanted to let everybody know why we're not starting. The third commissioner just said she's about 10 minutes out. Thank you very much. And the other two will not be will attending, not be here. correct? That's correct. Thank okay. you. So let's just sit tight and we'll wait 15 minutes and then we will take it from there. All right, thank you.
Hey guys, could I please have your attention? Um, it's now 1.15 and normal protocol is to wait 15 minutes before calling a meeting. And it is well within my authority as the chair of the meeting to call this meeting. I am going to wait five more minutes, five. And if nobody shows up for this meeting to reach our quorum, I will call it. So it's against my better judgment, but I have no control over it. So um, I will give it five more minutes, and at 1.20, we'll, we, we will either proceed or we will call the meeting. Thank you. On my behalf, I apologize. This yeah. is embarrassing to me. Sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. I was trying to find a ride here. I'm like, how am I going to get there? You ready, Mike? Uh, yeah. Okay. City clerk. There's my time. Oh. <laughs> Is there anything in the box that I should know of? In the, uh, in our boxes? Uh -huh. Okay. 
Do ring it. I'm trying to shut it off. I'm sorry. <laughs> if I had my phone, it would be very easy peasy. So, all right. Okay. You ready, ma'am? Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your patience. We do have a quorum, so we can go ahead and get started on this meeting. Today is Tuesday, July 2nd, July 2nd, and it is now 1.20. Um, we will go ahead and call this meeting to order. Those present are Vice Mayor Luke, myself, Mayor McDowell, Commissioner Carasone. We have our city attorney, city manager, our city clerk is having a fill-in by Ms. Laura, so thank you. And our recording secretary is Ms. Susan. Our police officer is Captain King. King. Hi, Captain King, sorry. Um, so if uh, we could all please for the stand for the pledge. And um, city manager, could you please lead us? Yes. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. So before we get on to the approval of the agenda, let's do some little housekeeping, especially since it's been a while since we've all been back in chambers. Welcome back, everybody. Um, packed house. Thank you very much. We do have overflow and some folks out in the um, vestibule area. If you want to make public comment, please make sure you fill out this card and hand it to the officer up here at the front. Those of you that are sitting outside of chambers, um, make sure you get your card to us as soon as possible so that I can call your name when your time comes to speak. Um, I will allow extra time for you all to come in two chambers to make your public comment. I know a lot of citizens are carrying signs. Please keep them down low. They have to be on the ground or sitting on a chair so as not to obstruct view of anybody in front of you. Make sure your phones are on silent so that way then we don't get interrupted. Um, there's also some rules of decorum I want to go over with everybody because it's been so long. Um, there's no clapping, yelling, screaming, obviously. If you need to show approval, just kind of use your fingers and clap your fingers together or give the down sign if you're really mad about something. We can see that. We don't need to disrupt the meeting by loud outbursts, OK? So this if you like what they're saying, this if you don't, all right? So let's go ahead and get started. We'll go ahead and get the um, um, approval of the agenda, please. So moved. Second. I a motion on the floor to approve the agenda as presented, seconded by Commissioner Carasone. Since our computers are not working, we're going to do everything by voice vote. Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Carasone? Yes. And I'm a yes. So the approval of the agenda has been completed. At this time, we will have general public comment. So we'll go ahead and have those. I will call you up three at a time. Please make sure you keep your distance apart from each other. Um, we will start with uh, Mr. David Fernstrom, uh, Mr. Dobrin and Jeffrey Scott. And you get three minutes to speak. And just as a reminder, we usually do not interact with any of the citizens during public comment. So um, please don't be offended when we don't uh, say anything you. about your comments. Thank you. All right, Mr. Fernstrom, you go ahead. Three minutes starts. Thank you. I'm David Fernstrom, a resident of West Villages and a member of the West Villages for Responsible Government, a registered political committee. Mayor, a couple of weeks ago when I confronted you about eavesdropping on our private WebEx meeting on March 23, I lost my temper and called you a liar. I apologize for losing my temper, but not for calling out your dishonest claim that it was a public meeting and you were invited to join it. The true facts are indisputable. On March 21, Victor Dobrin sent a WebEx invitation to a handful of our group's leaders and, and volunteers, <coughs> inviting them to participate in a private conference call on March 23. The invitation was personalized to each recipient and stated, quote, Victor Dobrin invites you to join this WebEx meeting, unquote. The invitation contained the meeting access code and an 11-character password. Nothing in the invitation suggested it was a public meeting. One of the people invited to join the meeting was Island Walk resident Bob Baker, who had previously said he supported our group's efforts and volunteered to help. 
He was invited because we believed him to be honorable and trustworthy. We were apparently wrong in that belief. Shortly after receiving the invitation, Mr. Baker emailed to Island Walk resident Michael Wasilik. The email said, hi, Mike, WebEx meeting on Monday, Bob, and it included Bob's invitation. After receiving Mr. Baker's email, Mr. Wasilik forwarded it to Mayor McDowell, along with the original invitation addressed to Mr. Baker. Mr. Wasilik's email stated only, quote, Mayor, FYI, hope you and your family are well, Mike. Mr. Wasilik's, unquote. Mr. Wasilik's email said absolutely nothing to suggest that he or anyone else was inviting the mayor to participate in the meeting. Mr. Wasilik, like Mayor McDowell, had previously stated his opposition to our group's efforts. Mr. Wasilik had also personally informed the mayor a few weeks earlier that he was opposed to our group and he was not part of our group. So on March 21, the mayor had a copy of an invitation clearly addressed to Bob Baker personally and emails from Mr. Baker and Mr. Wasilik that contained absolutely no suggestion that either of them was inviting the mayor to participate in the meeting or that they were authorized to do so. Nevertheless, the mayor informed Mr. Wasilik that she intended to listen in on our group's private meeting. On March 23, the mayor used Mr. Baker's login credentials to do just that. She logged in before anyone else, concealed the fact that she was eavesdropping by remaining silent when everyone else on the call was asked to identify themselves and listened to our entire conversation about plans, strategies, and volunteers. No one else knew she was listening, and no one consented to her listening. This that's my three minutes. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. City Clerk, could you make sure that I can see when their three minutes is up to? When they get down to five seconds, I will do this. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Mr. Dobrin? Victor Dobrin, a resident, a homeowner in Grand Paradiso. Good afternoon, commissioners and peoples of uh, Northport. With deep concern, I bring to your attention the violation of the public trust by Mayor McDowell through her eavesdropping on the meeting of 23rd of March, private of the steering committee of the West Villagers for Responsible Government, a group that stands in opposition to irresponsible government actions in our community. I organized a private meeting for the steering committee on March 23rd through my private account on the computerized web conferencing platform. The mayor obtained the login information to eavesdrop on our meeting from West Village's resident who she knew that opposes our efforts. She knew that was uh, left our group. She then used those credentials to sign, uh, login the city provided with the city provided cell phone to eavesdrop on our conversation throughout the duration of our meeting. At the beginning of the meeting, I asked every individual invited to identify himself or herself, and they did so. Only the mayor remained silent, and she later admitted that she did that because she knew we would not talk in detail about our political plans and activities if it, anyone knew she was listening. Mm -hmm. Well, we believe that Mayor McDowell, un underhanded action, violated the state's state eavesdropping law and the computer crimes law. We put our trust in our office, elected official and give them a license to do what is right for the public interest. The acts committed by mayor eavesdropping depict a flagrant violation of her oath to uphold the laws of this state and this nation that we have the flag we swear allegiance to. The mayor can no longer deliver her duties according to her oath. I respectfully, respectfully ask you, mayor, to resign today as you flagrantly violated the basic public trust. Thank you, Mr. Dobrin. Moving on to Mr. Scott. Good afternoon, commissioners, charter officers, public safety. My name is Jeffrey Scott. I'm a resident homeowner, Twinkle Avenue, within the city limits of our city. I'm going to talk about government ethics and bureaucracy. 
our local government bureaucracy is too big, with an emphasis on excessive spending, high levels of unionization, having very generous health and fringe benefits. With that being said, the prospect of keeping taxes low by shrinking local government is to enact a charter amendment that limits the growth rate of total city spending. How are we going to get rid of the city's senseless spending and the accompanying bad actors otherwise? By assigning a starting point that requires the board budget cuts to take effect immediately when the spending limit is reached. Right now, the general fund is nothing more than a city commission piggy bank. I'm advocating for right-sizing city government and privatizing select city services. This practice is a deliberate attempt. Excuse me. Currently, several city departments have merged in order to conceal redundancy in job duties. This practice is a deliberate attempt to protect jobs that are no longer needed, and this is logged by public admin as an end in itself. The current expansion of our city government is to is in detriment to every taxpaying resident who calls Northport home. I'm one of the many. I believe it is my responsibility to question the status quo, especially when it affects my pocketbook. Now I want to talk about uh, what happens when you wear a face mask. Number one, decreases oxygen leading to hypoxia. Number two, increases carbon dioxide leading to hypercapia and respiratory acidosis. Number three, increases sympathetic fight or flight response, which increases cortisol. Number four, increases your blood pressure. That's quite evident. Number five, suppresses the immune system, increasing susceptibility for infection. That's quite evident. And finally, number six, with a respirator or heart condition, underlying conditions, pre-existing, many of us have those, I do not, 61 years old. Uh, those with a respiratory or heart condition have an increased susceptibility for developing a life-threatening condition outside of COVID-19. Now, when you buy these masks, some of these masks are made, you don't know the fallout, it should say this, besides the warning on all mass packages disclosing the ineffectiveness at keeping viruses out. So this is a disposable Mr. Scott, mask. thank you very okay. much. Your time That's is fine. up. Right. Thank you. Yep. All right. So the next one is going to be for Mr. John Mizell and Paul Ke Kaley? Kale. Um, Kale. Kale, thank you. John Mizell? I'll wait till you get there and I'll start the clock. Yeah, I'll let Mr. Kale go first. I called your name, sir. Okay. Go ahead, please. That's fine. Three minutes, sir. Good Three afternoon, times, everybody. Sir. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm here to talk to you about what is truly um, an irregularity, potentially uh, He's illegal, state his name for illegal the activity. Did you say your name for the I'm sorry. No. My name is John Meisel. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, go ahead. I'm here to talk to you about what is absolutely irregularity as well as potential illegal activities associated with the proposed land swap um, that is included in ordinance to amend the index, site index map for West Villages 2020-16. The City of Northport Commissioner should refrain from acting on a proposed ordinance 2020-16 until the school board of Sarasota County has an opportunity to carefully review more, more details of the proposed site land swap. Premature approval of Ordinance 2020-16 substantially increases the risk of the city of Northport in becoming embroiled in a future legal action concerning the school sites. There's no need for the city to be hasty and take unnecessary risk and potential cost of litigation at the expense of the residents of the city of Northport. This start dates back to February of 2016 when WVID initiated an appraisal for the current site, 60 acres, located at the intersection of Prado and West Villages Drive, directly across the street from the stadium. This was done without any public comments or even suggestion of an activity by WVID to purchase a school site. Then in, 2006, in April of 25th of 2016, Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands, the developer, 
conveyed the property over to West Village's Improvement District. Make, make note of the date, April 25th. West Village's Improvement District didn't vote on approving that until, 20, until April 26th, the day after that it was conveyed over. Imagine, if you will, Mr. Lear cutting a PO for four hundred for four point nine five million dollars before you, as commissioners, had an opportunity to vote on it. It is no different. Then, um, fast forward five months later, in September, Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands enters into an agreement with Sarasota County School Board. Now, remember, they're not the owner of the property anymore. West Village's Improvement District is. In that agreement, they commit to convince or convey the transfer of the property per an agreement that they have with West Village's Improvement District for no consideration. When, when I asked for that document of that agreement between West Village's and Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands, they could not provide one. In fact, they said there isn't one, that it was a general agreement made between handshakes, if you will. There was no written obligation or anything Thank else. I'll continue much. later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazzo. Hit the down button. Hit the cancel. Shh. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we could try this again. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Cahill? Kale, yes. Kale, go ahead, um, please. You have three minutes, sir. Yeah, my name is Paul Kale. I'm a resident of the Oasis in the West Village. In the West Village, excuse me. Uh, and I'm going to continue with Mr. Fernstrom's statement since he did not have time to complete. Uh, on March 23rd, the mayor used Mr. Baker's login credentials to listen in on our private group meeting. She logged in before anyone else, concealed the fact that she was eavesdropping, eavesdropping by remaining silent when everyone else on the call was asked to identify themselves and listen to our entire discussion about plan strategies and volunteers. No one else knew she was listening, and no one consented to her listening. This violated Florida law, which prohibits anyone from listening in on other people's telephone communications without the consent of all parties. It was a despicable, illegal act that violated her oath of office. And I might add that I believe all commissioners are educated repeatedly after election on state law, so there's no reason not to know that this law exists. Madam Mayor, the only honorable thing to do is resign. Even Tricky Dick Nixon did that when he got caught spying on his political opponents and tried to cover it up. Thank you, sir. And last but not least, I have Mr. Uh, Severance. You did want to speak during this portion. Yep, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Rick Severance, and you I'm have speaking. Three minutes. Good afternoon, I'm Rick Severance, and I'm speaking on behalf of Welland Park, LLLP, which is the master developer of the West Villages. Related to the index map being presented by Welland Park today, we're committed to developing, constructing, and deficit funding to the tune of over $11 million, the new emergency services facility, which will house both the police and new fire stations, all of which are consistent with the existing agreements between the city of Northport and us, the developer. This emergency services facility is for the benefit of all the residents within the city. It is slated for immediate construction and will be located directly on US 41 at Prado Boulevard. The amendment to the index map is also increasing the park acreage within the development by an additional 73 acres for the benefit of all of the West Villages and the city residents. In addition, the revised index map reflects the potential impacts of our discussions with Sarasota County School District regarding the possible school sites as an alternative to the property that is currently owned by the school board. As a property owner, we have not solicited input, nor do we believe we're obligated to do so on any proposed land transaction involving property owned by us, Welland Park, or its affiliated entities, or property owned by the Sarasota County School District for that matter. The desire to consider alternative school locations was driven by the Sarasota County School District. Given their request for Welland Park to accommodate the future demand for students in our area with joint infrastructure, 
Our understanding is that the current need is not only for a high school site, which the current site will only allow for, but also a K through eight site to be strategically and thoughtfully developed in a shared and secured campus environment. Therefore, we have worked with the school board to satisfy their requested needs. Some of the prior comments today um, appear to be of concern about the school board's original acquisition to the, to the school site. While we do not think these comments have any relevance to the city's current consideration of our index map, we would like to point out that we have consulted with our attorney who confirmed that the previous transactions were handled consistent with purchase and sale agreements. These documents were all public record at that time, 2016, 2017. Therefore, we do not see any need to discuss this previous transaction further at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sever. Um, Ma'am, the lady in the blue shirt with your sign, could you please bring it up to the, I'm not asking you to hide it. Could you please bring it up to the front and put it in front of Mr. John Mazel? That way then you're not blocking the path, if you don't mind. Because I, I, I don't feel comfortable with the aisle being blocked. And if you could put it down so that way then it's not blocking anybody's view. Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. So city manager at this time, I am finished with public comment. So I'm going to turn it over to you for welcoming new employees, please. Thank you, Mayor. I'll invite our human resources director, Christine McDade up to introduce the new employees. Thank you. Good afternoon. For the record, Christine McDade. It's my pleasure to stand before you today to introduce some of our newest employees. When I call your name, if you could kind of wave, I don't think there are many people who aren't standing. Uh, from the city manager's office, we have Richard Murdoch, application systems administrator. We also have Phil Ann Pendergrass, Pendergrass, excuse me, service desk technician one. From fire, we have Brendan Hostetler, firefighter EMT apprentice. We have from Neighborhood Development Services, Jeffrey Burnham, Plans Examiner Inspector. Christine Johns, Staff Assistant 2. Barker Shackleton, Plans Examiner Inspector. From Parks, we have Autumn Coyle, Lifeguard 1. And as you can imagine, I'm sure most of our lifeguards are not here today. <laughs> Eric Deshen, Jr. Lifeguard 1, Jace Hay Burkett, Lifeguard 1, Francisco Hernandez, Lifeguard 1, Brett Poultry, Lifeguard 1, Valeria Molodeski, Lifeguard 1, Angelique Paradis, Paradis, I believe, Lifeguard 1, Kelsey Pope, Lifeguard 1, Justin Ramirez, Lifeguard 1, Brianna Robinson, Lifeguard 1, Kendall Saran, Lifeguard 1, Lindsey Stratton, Lifeguard 2. From police, we have Douglas Gaffney, a community service officer. Joseph DeWare, police officer. Christopher Crows, who is our background investigator. And John McDowell, a police commander with uh, the police IT. From Public Utilities, we have Joshua Allen, who's a water treatment plant trainee. Joseph Conway, Collection and Distribution Tech 1. Danny Larkin, Collection and Distribution Tech 1. And last but not least, from our Public Works Department, we have Thomas Lyon, welder fabricator. We have Walter Peterson, Solid Waste Equipment Operator. And John Reeves, Solid Waste Assistant. So on behalf of the city and our human resources department, we wish you the best in all you do and uh, uh, much success here at the city. Yay! <laughs> Welcome aboard. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, city manager, have we had anybody pull request to pull anything from the consent agenda? No, ma'am. 
Thank you very much. Move Could to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Motion on the floor to approve consent agenda as presented by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Carasone. Anything, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Commissioner Carasone? Yes. Voice vote to, to approve. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Carasone? Yep. And myself, yes. And that passed three to zero. Uh, moving on to presentation. City Manager, since our timer is not working, we'll use mine. Um, I will turn it over to you for the Building Department's uh, presentation, which is 15 minutes maximum. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Frank Miles, the Department Director, and Anthony Warren will come up to give the presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sure they can. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Commission. For the record, Frank Miles, uh, Neighborhood Services uh, Department Director. Uh, we have with us today our still kind of new uh, building official, Mr. Anthony Warren, who will share with you some of his uh, ideas, thoughts, and his vision for how we could move the department uh, uh, much further along in the building division um, of the city of Northport. Good afternoon, Anthony. Hello, Anthony. Miss Can you guys share the screen so this presentation shows up? And just be sure to state your name so we have it for the record. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Anthony Warren, City of Northport Building Official. I'm here to do a presentation on the future of the building division. So in order to talk about the future, we need to know um, the past of the building department and building codes and why we exist. Originally, the building codes were set up to combat um, fires on wood frame um, structures. Um, there were um, two great um, uh, fires that um, had a, a direct play in the development of the building codes. And that was the Great Fire of London and also the Great Baltimore Fire. The um, Great Baltimore Fire led an insurance group with the creation of the National Building Code um, in 1904. Um, and then also in the state of Florida, Hurricane Andrew in 1992, and that added strengthening um, um, wind resistance to the Florida building code and also flooding. And that's how we've um, been developing the, the building code. So taking that, we say, okay, these are the things that they exist for, and where can we um, go to keeping those things in mind? We can't eliminate why they were created. So the next thing we're going to go to is the functions of the building department. And it's to review plans for building code compliance and local ordinance pertaining to construction. The key to that is the pertaining to construction part. It's also to complete um, building inspections for minimum building code requirements. The key to that is minimum building code requirements. It's not for workmanship and those type of things where we get involved in, but those aren't our duties to carry out. We're there for minimum code requirements. The most important part is the protection of life, safe, health, and property. And that goes back to the history of the development of the building codes. So if you ask me on any given day, why do I exist? And I will say I'm here to protect life, safety, and health, and property of the residents, businesses, and visitors of the city of North. Now, there's been a lot of growth within um, neighborhood development services and the um, building division. From this month, um, dating back to the start of um, COVID-19, we've actually picked up um, the inspections. Our inspections were more than what we were last year, and also the um, submittal of um, permit applications. So the permit submitted increased on every month um, during the pandemic. The issuance decreased by a small portion, but it was still greater than the, the year before. 
and how do we manage this growth? I'm here to bring consistency. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk about you can call and get an answer from one person, call someone else and get an answer from someone else. Mm -hmm. So my job is to bring consistency so everybody is given the same um, answer. Also, to be open to adapting. We have a, um, a lot of new things that we're do doing here and trying to do here in the city of Northport, and you have to be open to adapting to those new things. Also, the interaction among, and communication among staff. Um, we have to act as if we're one entity providing a service to the citizens of Northport. So uh, the planning department, I don't look at it as a separate department um, than myself. We have to be open and communicate with those in order to get um, the end product to our citizens in Northport. And we also need to embrace the needs of the customer. And how do we approve that process? I personally ask myself four different things. The first thing is it allowable? And that is, do the stat Florida statutes allow it? Do local ordinances allow it? Do the Florida Building Code allow it? If any of those come up where it doesn't allow it, then we can't even go into the next steps. A lot of time I'll get a call about um, is something allowable or can they do something? The first thing I have to do is go to the codes, ordinance, and laws and see if it's allowable before I can give that answer. Um, the next thing is, is it good for the customer? Is it good for the city of Northport? And is it good for the Department of Division? So when I render this, a decision or an interpretation, I ask myself all those sort of things. We also need to streamline the permitting process. We can do that by eliminating duplicity, providing more over-the-counter permitting, also same-day permitting where you can come in um, possibly one day a week and walk out with your permit the same day, depending on what type of permit it is and who needs to be involved in it. Also online permitting where you never have to step in the office, where everything is done online. And I also want to reduce the turnaround time with ones that we do have to do a, a plan review for. But in order to do all that, we have to be open to change, communicate more within the departments, and um, meet in order for us to meet the needs of a customer. All right. Um, we also have to implement new technologies in order to achieve those things. So like um, software for plan review that allows for online um, permitting. Those are new things that we have to develop. And I want to talk about what's going on right now, um, not just in Norport, but also um, around the world. And that's the, what I call the COVID-19 effect. Um, we have to read think how we do business or although it was there and in the background, COVID-19 brought it up to a front to make us do it right now. So some of these things I've already been planning to do, we actually had to start doing it because we couldn't open to the public. But how can we still provide a service without being open to the public? So we take that and say, we can do it through COVID-19. Why can't we always do those services? So like curbside permitting and drop off and pickups. Um, pick up windows, also in the future providing kiosks where if you come into the lobby and there's, you see a, a, um, a line and maybe you can go off to the side to a computer like this and a kiosk and create your own uh, permit. Those are the type of technologies that we have to be op open to and then adapt for. All right, so getting into the future part of this. I'm 43 years of age. Right now, myself and people that are younger than me that's in the profession only represent 15% of all the code officials in this profession right now, and that's plans examiners, um, inspectors, and also building code officials. There's approximately well, over 50% of um, building code officials that are going to retire in the next five to 10 years. So 50% of the workforce is going to be retiring in the next five to 10 years. How do we put ourselves in a position to accommodate the, um, the loss of those um, employees. <coughs> I 
I think we do that by doing community outreach, starting with uh, elementary school students, summer camps, boys and girls clubs. In the past, I've um, worked directly with local fire departments and also Salvation Army, and we went out to um, K through five students and we did presentations and it was about disasters. Not my part of that disaster was how do I get in front of these group of students so they can understand how building codes work. And I came up with a evacuation plan. If there's a hurricane coming or your house is flooding, how do you get out? Um, that was just a simple thing. And that's a life safety plan that we have to submit when we um, do plan review now. So to get them in that thinking that this is what I need to look out in order to get out the house when a, um, a disaster happens, now we can get them thinking about how building works and how they function. Um, the size of the bedroom window for emergency escape and rescue openings is a, a building code, but it's for the fire department to actually be able to get in to get you out of it. So if they know that, now they don't place a dresser in front of that window because if something happens, the fire department needs to get in. But those things are um, uh, thought about uh, when it's time to move in and put your furniture in. So I want to get out in front of the, the younger kids so they can just start getting these little things as they're um, getting older. All right, I, we need to um, focus on value education beyond high school. And that's not just going to a four-year university. It includes technical, technical school, trade schools, which we have here locally. Um, on-the-job training, and also um, internships, which we're um, trying to bring here in the city of Northport, a building trainee um, program, which was developed by um, Department of Business Professional Regulations two years ago. Uh, currently, I am a um, career on the Career Advisor Committee at Suncoast Technical College, and I am um, bring fresh ideas as someone who went to school for construction management and architecture to um, give them an idea of uh, what students and, um, look for to be engaged um, and to improve the program curriculum and deliver strategies. Also, um, with me trying to create the building trainee program here in the city of um, Northport, that would allow someone to come directly from a trade school or uh, college or even high school without having the only job um, experience. Um, but that has to be approved by the state of Florida and um, myself um, operating for the city of um, Northport. I've already got half of that accomplished and getting approved for a continuing education program. And the next step is the actual, the programs itself, how they are written, how they're made up. And there's eight different ones. So for each license you have to have its own separate program. Um, originally, I submitted the whole package. If it was one package, I got the comments back to separate them out. But we did get approval to be an education provider. So that part is already done. OK, the, um, the on-the-job training, um, it eliminates the need of the five years of educational um, on-the-job um, experience that you needed in the past. So now we can get the younger crowd to be able to come in without going and working the workforce for five years. They can come in and be trained by myself directly in order to get that um, experience to, to gain a license. That's all I have. Thank you. It's a very good presentation. Uh, I learned a lot and I appreciate that. Does any of the commissioners have any questions? Uh, Commissioner Carrison, we'll start with you, please. I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to say how, how brilliant it is to look at the future development because it's something that we've talked about here for at least the last four years and previous. Um, just a heads up, we do have a youth board, a youth advisory board. And we did have an intern program. I'm not sure if we still have that or not. City manager, are you working on that, an internship? There's actually a trainee <laughs> program that um, Mr. Warren has put in the budget for next year, and you all um, so saw be back in the first the workshop. That's program. Cool. Awesome. So, I mean, it's, it's something that I think everyone in the professional industry is facing, that trying to create new blood to, and they all 
all these kids just have like a single mind. I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a lawyer, or I'm just going in the military. That's it. There's no other options, you know? Yes, that's correct. And so I, what you're doing is fantastic. I appreciate it. Um, I also want to say thank you for looking at the um, consistency of the department because that is one of the number one things that I get complained about, uh, complaints about is that there'll be a conversation to one person on what is required for offense and then another person what's required. So truly appreciate that because that's going to make our lives easier, administration's lives easier, <laughs> um, and that your minimum building code requirements Yes. is the key and just one final point hot water heaters <laughs> <laughs> what, was what was that last part hot water heaters oh <laughs> <laughs> you and your hot water heaters well, my <laughs> hot water heater was one of the spikes during the pandemic <laughs> it just annoys me that we have to get a permit go ahead guys so, uh, a couple of things <laughs> staying with the topic of consistency uh, you were talking about when somebody comes in and they want to do something, you look at, is it allowable? Uh, we still aren't completed, we haven't completed the ULDC rewrite yet. So curious question popped into my mind when you made that statement. Have you found inconsistencies from the state statute, state code, city code, so that you're taking note so that these things can be addressed within that rewrite. Yeah, so I like to state how I make my uh, approach. The Florida statutes, is a, that's a law. If it's in the Florida statutes, it has to be carried out, unless the Florida statutes provide an exception. Now, when it comes to the building code, the the Florida statutes and the building code says that the building officials is here to make that interpretation. So there are some things that you won't get for the city of Sarasota, Sarasota County, um, city of Venice, um, town of Longwood Key. Although I meet with that group um, once a month and I also meet with the group in Carter and um, Lee County and Charlotte County also once a month. We have different ideas of how to carry things out because locally we may be a little bit different in order to carry those things out. So I would say the Florida statutes can't be any more consistent than what it is. Is, is that person carrying out the Florida statutes? And then the other thing is the um, building code. The building code is an interpretation which should be put out. Now, something that I, um, I'm not afraid to say is the land use code is not for me to make that interpretation on. So that person who's over that has to make that interpretation. Some other people would try to do that. I know that it's not my job to do that and I don't want to do that because I may give the wrong answer. Because the answer I'm giving is the Florida Building Code answer which could contradict the land use code. So if I get a phone call and it's anything about land use, it's, I will get that person to give you a call back. And I think unfortunately people don't want to pass the buck so they would try to get an answer when they put themselves in the situation. So is there consistency within each individual group? There probably is, but as a whole, no, because there's different things. And that's why I'm here to make sure that everybody's talking the same way. So when we address the rewrite of the ULDC, we need to address the communication uh, between the departments or steps and yes. That. I appreciate your honesty with all of that, and that will make it more consistent, most definitely. I love processes and procedures and abiding by what needs to be. Um, the approval of the state was a comment that you made in regards to the internship. Uh, can you explain that just a little bit more of what they are looking for in order to have that approval or for us to get the yes. approval? So, the, and actually, so there wasn't confusion. We actually changed it to a building training program. Okay. That's what it is right now currently. So we can get rid of the confusion about internship. Okay. Because it's not a standard internship how we know it. Although that's what the Florida Department of um, Business and Professional Regulation refers to it as, as an internship. 
it's not what we typically say. We can just go get somebody and bring them in and let them work. That's not what it. That's not what it is. So that's why we changed the name for Northport to be building department trainee. But the application to the state is for an internship program, but it's not what we typically think of as an internship program. And what that right now, and in order for the guys you just mentioned, and um, for um, a call, did a roll call for them to stand up and say, this is a new plans and is an inspector. They had to present to me that they had five years experience in order for I can say, yes, I'm going to hire you and submit a affidavit to the state in order for you to receive a license. You had to have five years of experience half the workforce is going to be gone in the next five years. So the state said, hey, we have a problem here. What can we do to resolve this problem? And that was, the five years is going to be hard to get now. Let's develop something else. And that developed that internship, on which City of Norfolk calls a building trainee, in order for them to come immediately out of school. And their experience is coming directly under me as the building official while they are an employee of the City of Norfolk. Um, and they work off of what is called a provisional license, which allows them to work under my direct supervision um, until they obtain their standard license. But it's not a, I go to the local high school while he's still in school and say, hey, come work for the um, 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 building department as, a, as an intern. It's, it's not that. Not that simple, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to the state. Uh, so is there a criteria that you have to look for in this uh, trainee to uh, get the, the criteria is The criteria is in the application to the state, which is, I don't have it in the application in front of me, but I have to put together a program, and it's almost like I'm putting together a program if I was going to right. teach a 10th right. grade class Okay. and say, these are the items that I'm going to go over. And then the state approves that. OK, I yes. totally get it now. I thought <laughs> the approval was of the student or the trainee. The approval is actually of their training. Yeah. OK, thank you. That's it. And <laughs> you know, I, I think you're awesome. I mean, no you're problem. doing such a great job in there. Appreciate you. Thank you. Great presentation. I said it earlier, I even learned some new things on it. Uh, one thing you touched on, and it's very um, timely, is um, the role of the inspector. Too often these past couple of weeks, I've had citizens call and say, well, the inspector came out and passed it, but it's not up to snuff. They didn't finish this. They didn't finish that. Could you kind of weigh in on that for the public's consumption as to your role? Yes. So. Any inspection is a, a snapshot in time. So if I was called to go out and do a roofing inspection, I'm going out there and what's presented to me at that time meets the minimum building code requirements, the inspection pass. Let's say I pass the inspection, I walk away and that contractor pulls up everything out there and redo something else. I have no knowledge of that. Even if the homeowner calls me and I come back the next day, and it's still in the same state where I saw it in the day before, my, my ruling doesn't change because at that time, as I was taking a picture, that is the inspection. That's one part of it. The other part of it is we don't weigh in on workmanship. So if I go to a house to do a, um, a building final for them to get a CO, and I walk in there, and there's literally a, somebody walked by and put their elbow or put their knee into the wall, and there's a niche into the wall, it has nothing to do with minimum building code requirements. That, that inspection will pass. Now, should that contractor fix that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, but that's the contract between the owner and the contractor. That's not minimum building code re requirements. A lot of time, um, in general, the public thinks that the inspection has to do with workmanship, with quality of workmanship, and it doesn't. Um, so that's just, I can empathize with them, but I'm here to look at minimum building code. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, do we, since we have such a demand, such a need for inspectors, um, we have a lot of people coming from out of state. Are their building inspecting licenses good here in Florida? Are they reciprocal or do they have to go through the whole process to get a Florida license? Um, prior to July 1st, um, Michael, assistant city attorney, just sent an email yesterday and some things changed. So 
I can, I'll make a correction on myself. I'm telling you five years because that's all I've ever known my whole life. As of yesterday, <laughs> it's actually changed to four years. Okay. But again, that's one of the things where this, the state knows that there's a problem. What can we do to change this? So they went and changed the Florida statutes to not say five years, to say four years. Okay. There are some other little things in there, and the re reciprocal may be one of those things. I don't know if that actually changed, but... In order for me to get a state of Florida license, I actually have to take and pass the international code license, I mean the certification. Wow. Then I take Florida statutes in order to get a license. So even if they say, yes, it'd be reciprocal, I think at a minimum, they're still gonna to have to take the Florida statutes in order to get a Florida um, license. Um, I just don't know if that part changed. Previously, there wasn't. You came from out of state, you had to start the process all over again. As a matter of fact, the guy, Barker Shelkerton, that you just spoke to, he's a general contractor, um, or was a general contractor in Connecticut or somewhere, and that still wasn't enough. I had to send an affidavit saying that I believe everything he presented to me <laughs> and to send up to the state. So it's a very rigorous process. Um, they are making some changes. I just don't know if that was part of the, the change, but I do know that um, they changed five years to four years as of July 1st, 2020. So this is something to keep in the back of your mind for when we do go to Tallahassee next year and advocate for needs for our city. Um, if we can get some changes made with our elected officials at the state to help solve this um, need for getting inspectors, I, yes. I would love to meet with you and, and yes. figure and out. That's a, um, that's, I feel that that's part of my, my job personally. So that's why I sit on the career advisory committee for the mm -hmm. technical um, college. Oh, that's one of the only reasons why I do it. <laughs> do it. And so I can get this information out. The people at Sun Coast didn't, didn't even know that it even existed, this internship program even existed. Um, so me advocating those type of things is just, I take that on personal and think that's a personal thing I do to go out and talk to elementary kids about how to get out of their house. It isn't about just getting out of their house. Yes, that's important, but it's about them getting in their mind how a building functions, and then maybe when they get into middle school, maybe they get more into it, more involved in, hey, I'm curious about these things. Mm -hmm. um, even when I went to school for construction engineering technology, which I got my four-year degree in, I didn't know anything about how you become an inspector at that time. I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't care. All I ever wanted to be was a general contractor <laughs> yeah. and work as a project manager for a general contractor. An inspector, I knew it existed, but who were those guys? I didn't know. <laughs> but after I got out and then I um, was a project manager for a general contractor and I started going to the permitting office, that's when I started getting involved in it. I was 20 some years old at the time before I even knew what a building department was. So I take it amongst myself to get this information out to people to go out to the schools and, and talk to them and just get those things. It's not going to happen right this moment. No. In order for it to happen right this moment, that's by City of Norport creating the building training program to help with that. Well, when it comes time for us to go to Tallahassee, if there's anything that we can help lobby for yes. getting... Oh, yes, 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 further, yes. Just be sure and let us know. I got you. I <laughs> right. Does anybody else have anything? Sir, thank you very much for your presentation. You did right, a great thanks. job. I do appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, so now we are going to move on. Our proclamations and recognitions are time certain. What that means is at 4 o'clock, wherever we're at, we're going to stop and do our proclamations and recognitions. So we're going to move on to our public hearing second, ordinate, second reading of Ordinance 2020-24. City Clerk or Ms. Laura, could you please uh, read by title only? An ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending Chapter 3 of the Code of the City of Northport, Florida, and creating Section 3-15 regarding an additional homestead exemption for persons 65 and older with certain income limits, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Laura. City Manager, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Or No, this is City Attorney. Sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. This is second reading for the ordinance, um, and nothing has changed since first reading. So I'll be happy to help you with any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, guys, since we don't have buttons, I need to... Uh, Commissioner Carrison, do you have any questions? Uh, no. 
Move to approve ordinance number 2020-24 as presented. Second. Motion on the floor to approve ordinance number 2020-24 as presented, and that was made by Vice, uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Carison, seconded by Vice Mayor. Anything to that, Commissioner Carison? About time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor? Uh, we are a multi-generational city, and caring for the senior uh, population within the city, I think, is admirable, so definitely approve this. Thank you, and I, I do want to add, this is something that I, I learned by mistake when I was researching other things and saw that we did not have this available to our city. Um, and I thought that it was imperative to do this. While we have this on the books, we do have to have an educational campaign because this has to be applied for through the property appraiser's office every year before March 1st. Um, and I don't know if the city can help <clears throat> with that educational campaign. So I'm going to ask the city manager if that's something we can do if we direct it. Um, obviously, the difficulty in that is getting to the people who would apply to it. Um, we can certainly try to put some information out. We'll, our communication team will do the best that they can to reach the people. Um, but it would really the education for this would come more so from the actually the property appraiser and tax property collector's appraiser. office. But since they once they fully reopen, they'll have offices here. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure it's in their office as well. Fantastic. Do you Good think idea. we could put something in our newsletter that we get mailed to all the homes to say, hey, if you're if you meet these requirements, uh, be sure and put your application in by March first. Yes, ma'am, that's, that's part of what the communications team would do to get that information okay. out. That's one of the aspects, yes. Thank you, because it has to be done every single year, and I, I, I find that this is very important to do, and that's why I brought it forth, but we also have to educate about it. So thank you very much. All right, so now at this time, seeing no other questions or comments, we'll go ahead and do voice vote as the motion maker. Commissioner Carison? Yes. Vice Mayor? Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you very much, everybody. This is going to go really smooth. These guys should stay away more often. <laughs> no comment. You said it. <laughs> All righty, moving on to ordinance number 2020-25, and this is calling for a referendum vote, and I will have um, Ms. Laura read by title only, please. An ordinance of the city of Northport, Florida, calling for a referendum question to be placed before the qualified electors of the city of Northport, Florida at the November 3rd, 2020 general election, providing a referendum question determining whether to grant the city commission the authority to allow economic development ad valorem property tax exemptions for new businesses and expansions to existing businesses, providing findings, providing for the conduct of the referendum election, providing for the form of ballot, providing for notice of election, providing for the supervisor of elections to post a copy of this ordinance at each polling place, providing for an effective date if the referendum question is approved, provided for the filing of the ordinance with the Sarasota County Supervisor of Elections, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Laura. City Attorney. Yes, Mayor, this is second reading of Ordinance 2020-25. There have been no changes since first reading, so I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. I move to approve Ordinance number 2020-25 as presented. Second. Got a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor to approve Ordinance number 2020-25, and that was seconded by Commissioner Carison. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? Uh, it's a tool in the toolbox in order to approve We don't have city. any public comment, right? Uh, tool and toolbox for this city to grow, so I'm all for it. And Commissioner Carison? No. No? Okay. <laughs> and and I, I should, I'm, I'm, part of me is used to doing Zoom meetings, and part of me is used mm -hmm. to looking over here and seeing that there is no public comment. So just for the record, I know I have to get back into the habit. There is no public comment for this item. Um, I have no comment on it either. I just... It, it's a definitely good tool to have in the toolbox. So we'll go ahead and take voice vote uh, as the motion maker. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Yes. Commissioner Carison. Yes. And myself, a yes. Thank you. And that also passed unanimously, three to zero. Moving on to ordinance number 2020-28, and this is amending the building code um, 
building fee schedule. Uh, Ms. Laura, could you please read by title only? An ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the code of the City of Northport, Florida, Appendix A, City Fee Structure to Change Certain Building Fees, Providing for Severability, Providing for Conflicts, Providing for Codification, and Providing an Effective Date. Thank, Thank you, you very much. City Manager. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. This is the second reading. The only change from the first reading to this one was the adding of um, per city commission direction to one of the whereas clauses, the fourth one. Um, so with that, I'll just open up to questions if you have any. Does anybody have any questions on this item? The only question I had was answered in the last meeting. <laughs> All right. Seeing no questions and seeing no public comment. I'm sorry. Actually, go ahead, I'm Commissioner sorry. Carson. I do have one question, and it kind of crosses over to a um, uh, one of our what we'll be discussing later, but it has to do with the uh, fees that we had for sheds. That's been removed, right? Or uh, I believe uh, that there was a reference that there should be a reference that road and drainage would not have to, because I, I had to re-listen to the meeting back in 2018. So I wanted to make sure that was 25% decrease. I know, but it will still list all those things. So I just wanted to make sure it didn't get sucked back we'll in or in that, put back in out. That next item. <laughs> But while we, we're here, we could actually amend it if those things were not reflected from the 2018 meeting because it is the same code. City manager can speak to that, but I That's did see it going. written as I was preparing evidence mm -hmm. for the next agenda item or that particular agenda item, but please speak to it. City attorney or city manager, did you want to speak to the question? Uh, yes, ma'am. It cannot be amended on this item because the title block it relates to building fees and the fee that the commissioner mentioned is in the road and drainage section of the fees. Thank you, because I thought it was under something else when it was talked about. So that makes sense. Thank you. I uh, move to approve ordinance number 2020-28 as presented. Second. Motion on the floor by Vice Mayor to approve ordinance number 2020-28, and that was seconded by Commissioner Carasone. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? Uh, especially as this pandemic lingers and economy is still at a place where it is, I think doing this measure is um, a good thing for the citizen. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carasone? No. All right, seeing no other comments, uh, we'll go ahead and do voice vote as the motion maker. Um, Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Carson? Yes. And I, too, am a yes. Thank you very much. So now we have to move on to our quasi-judicial hearings. Um, we're going to hear ordinance number 2020-16. And Ms. Laura, if you could please introduce and read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the Unified Land Development Code, Section 53-213A2, Village Index Map, providing for amendments to the West Village's index map for certain portions of Villages Village F, Village G, and Village I, including one or more of the following. Boundaries, acreages, locations of police, fire stations, and utility sites roadway alignments, village centers, park acreages, potential school sites, hotel site, and deleting a local road, providing for findings, providing for adoption, providing for filing of approved documents, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, and providing an effective date. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Laura. And at this time, I would like to swear in those that would like to provide testimony. Fantastic. Can you hang on one second? just before we do that. City Attorney, I know when we had first reading, and I didn't think of it until City Manager mentioned it to me that we combined these items. Should we keep them separate or should we combine them? That's up to the board's discretion. Um, as you know, in our procedure, there are time limits involved. So if the board is interested, whether the board's interested in combining them or not, I think it should be addressed by board vote. If the board would like to reduce the time, that would need to be done through party agreement. 
of all parties. Okay. Um, I don't know what the will of the board is. Was this, this was combined in the first reading, correct? Right. So I think that in order to stick with consistency that we should do exactly what we did <coughs> in the first reading. Combine them. Combine them, but I thought we had, I'd have to look at the minutes. I thought we had a limitation to the. We have, each presentation is yeah. allowed, um, tw I'm sorry, each presentation is allowed 20 minutes. There's three items, so that would allow each presentation to be one hour. I thought there was something less than that when we did this the first reading. There I was. believe we reduced the time frame. Yeah. But I that may have been the case, but because the time is set by code, the, the board mm -hmm. can't do that. We would need the applicants to state on the, the applicant and the city, all parties, to state on the record that they are fine um, with a reduced time, something that's less than triple the totals. Let's get them with tripling it if they don't use the full yeah, time, and so to. be it exactly. Instead of trying to, I was just trying to stay like consistent that. with the first reading because this is a second reading, and I wasn't sure if we, I guess it doesn't matter. No, okay, all right. I'm, so, I'm getting let's, the eye. if there's a will of the board to combine and allow 60 minutes per presentation, and um, one, let me double check the time for the. Rebuttal. I think, Mayor, all we, all we have to say is that you want to combine the items because then the code provisions kick in, so it automatically be triple all the time limits. May I get I'll it? make a motion that we combine uh, ordinance number 2016, 2014, and 2015 for discussion. For purposes of the quasi-judicial procedures. Okay, thank you. For the and purposes of the quasi-judicial process. Second. Motion on the floor is stated by uh, Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Carrison. Anything, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Commissioner Carrison. Yeah, do we have any agreed parties between then and now? Nobody signed up. Okay. And um, I, I'll get to that okay. once we get past this motion. Good. Okay. All right. <laughs> I wasn't sure no because that adds time. Of so, course. Okay. All right, so we have a motion on the floor as stated by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Carrison. We'll go ahead and take voice vote. Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Carrison? Yes. And myself, yes. So we are going to go ahead and combine these. Um, at this time, um, Ms. Laura, since you already read Ordinance Number 202016 into the record, could you please now read Ordinance Number 202014 and Ordinance Number 202015 into the record? An ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the Unified Land Development Code, Chapter 53, Article 18, V Villages, Section 53-214, F6, Village F, Village District Pattern Plan, West Villages, amending the boundary of Village F to add plus or minus eight acres to the southeast area of the village and adjusting the neighborhood layout providing for findings, providing for adoption, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. And ordinance number 202015, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the Unified Land Development Code, Chapter 53, Article 18, V Village, Section 53-214, F7, Village G, Village District Pattern Plan, West Villages, amending the boundary of Village G to add plus or minus 41 acres to the southwest corner of the village and amending the neighborhood layout, providing for findings, providing for adoption, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you very much, Ms. Laura. If you could please swear in all those that are wishing to give testimony, including those that have given public comment cards. Please, if you'd like to give testimony, raise your right hand. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, so help you God? I do. Thank you very much, Ms. Laura. City Attorney or City Manager, do we have any aggrieved parties for any of these applications? I believe that would be a question for the City Clerk, Mayor. Thank you very much, City Clerk. Do we have any aggrieved parties? Not that I am aware of. Thank you very much. All right, so at this time, the applicant goes first. You, Ex parte. Yeah. Oh, ex parte, yes, of course. Ex parte communication. Thank you, guys. Um, Vice Mayor, your ex parte communication, please. Uh, I'm going to go 
I have actually a few, uh, several. We're going to go back in time after first coming on board. Uh, we've been involved, or I've been involved in several conversations of that index map where they talked about property being swapped out, used, and the school board property was part of those. Uh, no definite dates because it was mentioned and talked about often. Uh, on June 6th, I uh, received an email from Mr. Shaughnessy. It's forwarded for ex parte communication to the clerk. Same with um, uh, on June 9th, uh, an email with Mr. For, from Mr. Dorbrin. Uh, on 6 8, I had a phone call with John Lewinsky. Uh, things were uh, just briefly discussed uh, in regards to the cancelization or postponement of that 6 9 meeting, uh, or the item on that being pulled from the agenda. Uh, 7 1. <laughs> I mean, just within the last couple of days, uh, I've had emails that I have forwarded to uh, the clerk's office for um, the ex parte for the file. Uh, I had a call with assistant city manager, city manager in regards to um, the school board meeting, the outcome and that. And I spoke with even Mr. Mizell this morning or about noontime as uh, I came in to clarify or give a little information on what quasi-judicial procedures were. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Carson. Um, yeah, I, hopefully we're not going back because then we're talking about, like, for me, 2003 <laughs> all the way through 2010, city attorney. And if, I mean, I can't remember all of that. And if there is anything, it's uh, it's on the record from back then. But I can tell you that uh, even back then, we've discussed, you know, a school area and possible changes in the future land use. And so, I mean, was it discussed? To a certain degree. Um, and that's prior to 2010. Then on top of that, I did have a conversation this morning with Mr. Um, Wazinski, and it was literally just about the progress going on there uh, as far as the, um, the downtown area and um, just the emails that were received within the last month, I'd say. That's really it. Thank you. Uh, my ex parte communication involves uh, long ago, I took a tour with Marty Black of the Village G. So that would be considered a site village, uh, I mean, a site visit. Um, I have had numerous emails from citizens. Um, some I responded to, some I have not. Um, I sent all of those to the city clerk. Uh, yesterday, I watched the school board meeting from June 16th regarding the property and, and land um, agreement between the West Villages Improvement District, I'm sorry, between the Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands and the school board. Um, I had a conversation with Assistant City Attorney, I'm sorry, Assistant City Manager uh, Yarborough after um, I had sent him a couple of questions um, regarding what I learned at the school board and based on emails from the citizens. I forwarded those emails and to the city clerk for the record. And I think that is all of them. All right. So now at this time, we'll move on to the applicant. And if you have one hour, since there's three items, obviously, if you don't need to use that whole hour, it is up to you what you want to do with it. But your time starts now, ma'am. Good afternoon, commissioners. It's good to see you in person again. I'm Katie Labar with Stantec, representing the West Village Improvement District for the index map amendment and Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands for the two pattern plan amendments. Um, as you all know, this is second reading. We gave a very detailed presentation uh, when we came before you for first reading. Um, I'm here to tell you that the changes that were requested at that first reading have been made. 
both to the index map. There were two notes that you asked to have revised. They were revised and they, should, they are reflected in the drafts that you have in your packets today. And then on Village F, we also updated the wetland impact exhibit to reflect the location of the utility site as discussed at that meeting. And so all the changes that you requested have been made and we ask for your favorable decision today on all three items. That's it. So seeing that you haven't taken up maybe three minutes, are you saying that your presentation is complete? I have, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We are concluding our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alrighty, so now I will allow um, staff to go ahead and make your presentation. And you folks also have one hour. Again, you don't need to use all of it if you choose not to, but you do have an hour. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Allison Christie, Neighborhood Development Services. Um, as the applicant stated, uh, this is second reading, so we don't have a presentation. Um, I just want to state for the record, we did make all of the requested changes to all three ordinances, and the applicant did make the requested changes to the documents. And that's it. Just for the record, since you didn't even take two minutes, um, <laughs> are you concluding your presentation? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Moving on to rebuttals. I have a feeling this isn't going to be worth setting the time, but you do need to come up and make your rebuttal or make a statement. We accept everything that staff placed on the record this, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. And staff? Staff has no rebuttal. Thank you. So we will move on to public comment. And it is strictly on these items before us for um, the West Village's index map and the Village F and Village G. All right, so starting with Mr. Dobrin. And then Susan, oh goodness, I'm so sorry, Mulligan. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, John Miza. Good afternoon, Victor Dobrin, a resident and homeowner in West Villages. I think that we own to each other, citizens and commission, to respect why we are here. You have a fiduciary duty on the money we pay, and to approve those measures, regardless what they are, and some of them, they are back in some of these uh, ordinances, if they are fair, transparent, and done with integrity. So, Data was provided to you. I've seen emails and so forth. It is your judgment to compare your integrity, your conscience, because I don't know if someone invented anything to clean a conscience yet. So with that being said, I will recommend that you take a slower approach, approve those ordinances which have no doubts, no repercussions, financial as well as uh, for the residents regarding location. And I will take the land swap deal. As I talked to one of the commissioner live, like uh, uh, Sarasota School, um, he was invited to our community. And as I recalled reading the press as well as developments available from the school board, there is no imminent need to build a school there. So I would say, apply your integrity, whatever that level it is, apply your good judgment, and separate. You can amend the ordinance, let everything what the developer needs. United States is great. We should put both interests on the same level, citizens and special interests. I'm not saying to rip off nobody here, but let's do the right thing. And you have the right and you have the duty and the opportunity to do just that by amending and letting that for a later date. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Dobrin. Can I speak here? And when you get up there, could you please state your name for the record and that you had been sworn? What was the last part? And that you were sworn. Did you? Did you? Oh, sw yeah, I did. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Mugalian. I live in Island Walk. And were you sworn? Were you I sworn? was. Yes, I was Thank sworn. You. Sorry. Um, 
There's a land swap in the works, and I'm talking to the, the two school things, particularly. And when, back with West Villages, meant Grand Paradiso and Island Walk, we had several meetings about uh, spending some of uh, money from districts one, two, and three within West Villages. And one of the things we spent money on was this uh, school area over near where the ballpark is now. And with that, I believe we spent several million dollars. And with all of this talk of land swap, there has been nothing said about remunerating the areas that spent the money for the land. And now this new school area is going to be for the benefit of several more areas that will not have spent the money for the land. And I'm curious why nobody has, ex has addressed the monies involved here. Um, and with this, I'm concerned that the commission, who I don't believe any of you live in West Villages, are not involved in the less than West Villages individual things that are going on. Um, I've been to several meetings where they talk about, oh, if you're in District 1 or District 2 or District 3, and we bought the land in District F, I guess, and now they want to give other land and swap it with another district that wasn't even a district when all of this was brought up. I just think you need to pay a little bit more attention to the inner workings of West Villages before you vote massively on this. Uh, it's important to have the schools, it's important to have the school land, but when you're talking about land, swap dollar for dollar. Don't swap, oh gee, this acreage for this acreage because some of it is all of a sudden in a wonderful place right next to the ballpark. Also, if that's for the high school, it's right next to the junior college. And now in this day and age, kids who are going to high school also can take college, college courses. If it's physically right next to the college, that makes that a lot easier than if it's four or five miles away. That's all. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, thank you. Mr. Mizell. Your three uh, minutes. Hi, John Meisel, uh, West Village resident, and I was sworn in. Um, I, I want to go back to where I left off. Let's go back to April 25th, 2016. The property was conveyed by Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands to WVID on the 25th. It wasn't voted on until the 26th. Fast forward to September, five months later. Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands enters into an agreement with Sarasota School Board and commits to conveying the property for which they don't own in return for $3.65 million in impact fee credits. So not only did they sell the property for 4.95, which was appraised at 4.7, but they also got the benefit of $3.65 million in impact fee credits. That's $8.65 million that they received for that land of property that they don't even own. Now fast forward and oh, Part of that agreement stipulates that they have an agreement with WVID to have the property conveyed for no consideration. There is no such agreement. They've acknowledged that there's no such written agreement. Part of that agreement says that the proper, the agreement between Sarasota County Schools and Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands says that that property will be conveyed within six months or the agreement is null and void. Again, null and void. There is no amendment to that agreement until June 30th, which has nothing to do with extending the agreement. The property was not conveyed until nine months later. So who owns the property? West Village's Improvement District or Sarasota County School Board? The developer will say it's Sarasota County School Board. Because yeah, they signed the agreement effective September 22nd, 2016. It wasn't conveyed until June of 2017, which is almost nine months later. So that's up for question. And probably a court is going to have to decide that, or they're going to have to come to an agreement with Sarasota County School Board. My point is, don't be so hasty to approve something for which, obviously, there's irregularities. One would question why a developer could profit twice off the same piece of property at the expense of us taxpayers, those of us from WVID that are paying that bond. They'll say that they're deficit funding. Of course they're deficit funding. That's part of their business plan. 
They're going to build a fire station. Of course they are. Will they be reimbursed? Absolutely. Are they carrying the cost of that money? For sure. Are they deficit funding that five, that four point nine five million? Yeah, they own seventy percent. But are they doing it for thirty years? You bet your you bet your fingers. They're hoping they don't have to because they plan on selling those units within the next five years. So whoever burdens those units is carrying that cost for eighty percent of it. So let's not kid ourselves about who's doing what's right. There's obviously an irregularity. Rick will tell you, do not look in your rearview mirror because he wasn't around, and I don't fault Rick for that at all. We had this meeting, but you can't go back and undo what was done. Thank you. Vote very with much your sir. conscience, please. Okay, you're, you can stop now. Why does he want to stop? Okay. Just shut the phone off. I did. You want me to call you? Right? Yeah. There we go. I guess it has to go through the whole beeping system to let me know that it's there instead of anyhow. Um, so thank you very much for the public comment. I do not see any more cards. Yes. Uh, moving on to commission questions. Uh, any commissioners have any questions that they need to ask the applicant or the city staff or anybody else? Uh, Vanessa Scott, oh, sorry, Go ahead, I got my Harrison. finger up. Go ahead, <laughs> okay, um, as you know, the whole school shift has really been heartburn to me. Um, we are talking about removing X amount of acres. Um, but then replacing it with that. Can you just kind of summarize that for me again? Because again, you know, my, my biggest concern is that we are going to allow schools here to supply schools for Englewood residents under the non-taxable value for Northport. And that really irks me, so. Uh, for the record, Nicole Gerhaus, planning division manager, and I have been sworn. Um, so what the index map proposes to do is to remove um, the acreage from town center upon conveyance of the land, um, and it would put the new acreage in uh, to village K, village K. Um, and so it's, it is an increase in acreage. I believe it's from 60 to 120. Um, but the 60 acres goes back into our town center, which increases our tax base, and the other land is That's not what in it town was. center. I'm trying, this seems like it was forever ago, so I'm just trying to remember um, why I actually kind of swayed my thought process on this because I was not We're for it. We're getting 60 acres of town center back, so the city's tax, for the That's city's tax base was. purposes, that increases um, our diversity. Much, our diversity in our tax base, okay, because I know I wasn't for it originally, but then you guys talked me into it and there had to be a reason. That'd be a good reason. <laughs> All right, so um, so we're adding the tax base, which is not what we have now, and it's not. If we failed this today, it also would not um, flow through with our comprehensive plan or our future land use or any of that, wouldn't it? Kind of. So the the future land use on the property and the zoning on the property is village. Village allows for schools. Well, you, um, yeah. So this is kind of more of your master plan. Okay. Um, you know, if we're going to put it in analogies with how non-West Village's development goes. So the master plan currently shows, hey, we're going to put a school here, and they're proposing to put that into a new location. So it's kind of like an amendment to the master plan. <coughs> okay. But the, the zoning, it does allow the school regardless. That's, okay, that's what I was trying to kind of get at. And then the... Um, the town center has been shifted to the area that's closest to 41, correct? So that it provides more flow and accessibility. The current school site is within the town center boundaries. Right. And so you now take a 60 acres that is off of our tax rolls and put that back on our tax rolls. Okay. So, so it's, it's not it's shifting the town neutral. center boundaries, but we're adding that acreage. We're taking that acreage, putting that acreage back on our tax rolls. So it's revenue neutral. Essentially, because uh, 
we're not, well, actually, it's probably a, a revenue positive because now we're going to add it as a town center versus Village K as just residential. Correct. Okay, all right. Um, I think my next question would be to the applicant. Let me ask you about this conveyance from, because as someone who's been here and was part of this whole districting thing, um, Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands was West Village District. I mean, they're the ones who kind Minnesota of. Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands is one Could of the. Could you please state your name for the record? Oh, in John Rosinski, Senior Vice President with Wellen Park LLP. I did. Uh, Minnesota Beach Ranch Land. Zinsky, is could you one state that for the record, please? The the gesture doesn't huh? record. Could you they state for the record whether you were sworn? Yeah, yes, I was sworn. Thank you. Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands is one of the entities that fall under historically the West Village's LLP, now renamed Welland Park LLP. Mm -hmm. They sold a piece of property that ultimately went to the Sarasota School District, sixty acres, which had forty three acres that were developable, basically some wetlands in it, for the intended use of a K through eight school site. Now they, they sold it to the district? It went through the district. And again, as you know, I wasn't here at that time. And my understanding was- I don't think any of us were here at that right. time. But the unit ahead. one bonds that uh -huh. were used to buy it were originally slated to go for the initial fire station. Right. And at that point in time, the, there was a desire not to build the fire station because the city didn't, was in a position to staff it. That uh -huh. money at that point went then to buy the school site, mm -hmm. and that transaction occurred. That school site was intended, like I said, to be a K-8 through site. What's coming up now is the school district's more immediate needs is for a new high school. And they need a much larger site than 43 developable acres for a high school site. So I when they, they say 70 to acres, 70 to 80 acres for the high school. So when they say they need a new high school site, that's the more pressing need. Right. Ultimately, they and that it. that high school site is going to support uh, that high school site is. Being analyzed as a need through the city of Northport residents is that that's what I'm wondering. Well, it'll serve Northport residents, and it may, have, over time, support residents that are close to the city of Northport, like our southern parcel property. Yeah, see, of Welland Park is not within the city of Northport. This new right. site is central to the overall property, and thus will make it easier for people to walk and get to and be more removed from being across the street from the Brave site, which wasn't contemplated when the initial acquisition occurred. Uh, well, so yeah, it, nobody knew about the Brave. Right, so as they started looking at the need for high school, it made sense for them to try to create a campus environment where they could have both K through 12 campus together. Mm -hmm. They talk, started talking with our predecessors about some type of deal to purchase a site which meant the existing site was no longer needed, would we buy it back? Because when we sold it, there was a deed restriction placed on it that the property could only be used for a school site. And I, I swear the original school site was actually way over by Taylor Ranch, originally, originally. No, there is there a school there. There were two original school sites. Okay. There yeah. was a technical school site by the college high right, school, right. and then there was a 30-acre um, site that was kind of right smack in the middle of everything. Um, it was further. It was basically kind of where this one is, but further west. Mm hmm So where's that original one? The original one and the 15-acre were combined into that was it was 15 acres and 30 acres. Those were combined into the 60-acre site on an index map amendment. 30 and 15 or 45. Yes, they were combined into a, a bigger site. Um, as he said, it was about 43 usable acres, so I don't know if that's maybe why. But, maybe um, that's why. So it, that was the 60-acre site, and now we're looking for a full 
um, K through 12. So the, the 15 acres, though, was over right in front of Village D, correct? Or in the No, in it the was Keys. directly yeah. east of the, the I'm sorry. State College. You're right. It was, it was by State College. I see it now. Okay. Um, why can't this site be moved to the left or to the south? Or caddy corner to Mayaka Pines Golf Course. It has been clear that this site wouldn't be completed for another 20 something years. Um, at least I thought that's what the last conversation was. What was 20 years? <clears throat> that it would take an unbelievable amount of time for the schools to no, build. No, the intent is. School Come up to the front and state your name, please. The school sir. district's intent, and that's why they engage us in discussion, is to have that school high school site open. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're going back and forth a little bit with superintendent changes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the belief is either August of 24 or August of 25. And as we started to talk with them last fall, that's when it became apparent no matter what to fulfill the needs of the school, we needed to start, we being the developer, start the design and programming for Minnesota Beach Road. So we had we went ahead and submitted plans. We recently, the city provided us a DO to construct Minnesota Beach Road from River Road through Prado. Obviously, depending on the actual needs of the school district and timing, is when we'll build that road. But the intent is that road needs to be built about, we need to start it about 12 months before they will start building the school. So we really have to have that road done. And that road about will then hook up to the months. other the other portions. It'll tie into West Village's Parkway. It'll tie into Prado. It will provide access to the new water treatment plant that is under construction. So we've got, now we have the plans designed. We can act out based on the school district's timing. The okay, thought is they may be asking us to start that road as early as the first quarter next year, figuring a year from that, because it's a lot, large project, they may be starting a new high school. Okay. The reason why I'm asking all this is because I was actually on the Sarasota County Planning Commission mm -hmm. when the extension of Minnesota Beach Road was presented and approved. So I know what the future will bring right. as far as that corridor is concerned. Well, my concern is there will be a higher demand in the future if you pull this out of the city of Northport boundaries, keep it in the West Village District, I, or Wellen Park LLP, um, but you put it outside of the the city of Northport's boundaries, and you put it in an unincorporated city of or unincorporated Sarasota County. If we if they had ten or fifteen years to build a school site, that may be possible. We don't have the availability of water and sewer in the next five years. No, there's Englewood water and sewer right there. We got it again. What did we just do with Northport? We built a new wall. We're building a new water. We built a new wastewater. Mm -hmm. That takes three to four years just to start doing the process. Again, we're not going to go south of the city of Northport line. We're going to continue in an orderly process of, to develop. We're not going to hopscotch because every mile we extend is millions of dollars. I'm only talking about the school portion. I and know, if, but if I don't the have school water. board wants to build, they should get the water. Sorry, I don't see how that's your problem. They should have addressed this issue many years ago when we were screaming for a high school back in 2008. So I have You're, no... 12 years later, they're in no, high school. Yeah, don't look to me for feeling sorry for them. So my, my point is, is that pull that untaxable value out of the city of Sarasota, or city of Sarasota, wow, they must be cursing me, huh? City of Northport... Put it in the unincorporated county um, section because there is Inglewood water and sewer there. That it's it, there's lines literally up and down River Road um, that you could hook up, do a 
do a, um, they're in my client's golf course. Not that easy. Anything else, Commissioner Carousel? I just don't like that it's a school section site. That's that's really what my my absolute aggravation is, is that it's being the school site that will be an untaxed burden on on the city. And I get it. Yeah. I get it. You're gonna get we're gonna get more right. but you have to remember that I was here in the beginning when it was mm -hmm. only fifteen acres. And now we're talking sixty. It was 45. It was always 45. 45. And now we're talking how much? Uh, they are looking to buy 130 acres. 130 from us. acres. So it's a plus 70. And I think there's about 15 acres of it are wetland. Okay. Doesn't matter. 130 acres, right? Mm hmm. And of the 130 acres, we're getting 60 back. Yes. Right. So that is a 70 acre deficit. Mm -hmm. when we were only looking at 45 in the but, day. Yeah, but like as Nicole said, you're probably taking 70 acres from pure residential to mixed use village center or town center. Well, town center is different. It's town, the, the 60 acres are town center. So they have to meet the, our minimum town center requirements. No, no, I get that. But I'm saying that I thought that uh, some of the swap of land was actually in the town center originally, so some of it was accounted for as commercial But property. then it was removed for the school, and the school parcel has a speed restriction that it can only be used for the school. What a, what a sticky wicket uh, this whole thing is. Um, last question. You, uh, not you, obviously, you're representing a group. Don't make me, don't think that I'm questioning you or drilling you as no an problem. independent person. Um, but the district spent money on purchasing the property for the school board or the school board's going to pay the district. I'm not sure. The that. original purchase went through the district. This deal does not have anything to do with the West Village's Improvement District, it is a contract between two landowners. Okay, okay. Because I thought that the landowner being ranch land actually owned it. Yes. And they dedicated it to the school. And that was back in the... That, that was the old transition. Correct. This uh, activity is ranch lands would sell 130 acres of Sarasota School District. Ranch lands or one of our LLCs would purchase the existing 60 acres. Okay, which I'm talking before that. Okay, I'm the talking right, I'm talking the original plans, the, the original, original future land with, use, the original the transaction with, was that Minnesota no, Taylor Ranch actually right. owned the property. No, then we got and it. And then it was given to Minnesota Ranch Lands. Yeah. And he, when we created the district and we created the, the West Village District and annexed in, um, when we did the development for the future land use is when those, that, that 45 acre parcel was dedicated as school, given to the school. So there was no, no I don't exchange of money. Was Maybe it was just designated. It was put on a map That's as probably a future what it was. school site. That's what I was trying to wrap my head right. around because I don't remember the district purchasing any property for school or vice versa. They did purchase the site as part of the transaction for these, uh, this 60 acre site. But that was that was the In village 16. K, correct? No, it's village no. E, but it may have been a different number before. Village E. Yeah. Yo. It was E, but it was something else before that. Right. Actually, it was part of the overall town center, and the town center didn't have a village label at that point. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, all right. 2005. Yeah. All right. We it's, move on to uh, Vice Mayor, and then yeah, we'll sure. Back. I'm sorry. I, it's okay. I have a couple more questions, that's and fine. then that's it. Vice Mayor. Um, first of all, 
as the parties, both of you as parties in a quasi-judicial hearing, did you receive all the ex parte emails so that you could uh, speak to or address what was stated? I know some of the public comment has touched on some of the issues, but I'm wondering if uh, you were given those. I did receive 23, 24 emails okay. late this morning. Wow, okay. Thank you. Uh, that's what I wanted to make sure because it was you who pulled this item from the last hearing. That is correct. So that you could look into the details of what the concerns were. Mm -hmm. um, that was awesome. I mean, that was outstanding that you as a party would want to look at those details. Uh, I know tax base sounds good to anybody sitting up on a dais, but also we care about the concerns of our citizens also. But I don't sit in a position where I handle the district. I mean, uh, citizens out there chose to live within an independent district, and I'm very, very limited on what I can do or speak to within a district. So hearing the concerns of the citizens out there since the last hearing that was postponed, um, I know the index map changes. It's changed umpteen times before. It can be changed again. Even when you speak with the school board, the outcome can be something different, and you bring it to us, and we change it. You know, so I know all that that can be done. Even, even if they find that there's something invalid in the transactions, you know, with what is being debated, we can also change it at that point. Am I not correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, so if I may add to it, the index please. map that is currently in effect was approved, I believe, July last year. One of the main reasons we are updating it now is one to reflect the agreements we made with the city with the post annexation agreement and the realignment, which we knew about, or my predecessors knew about when we were processing village G and F VDPPs but they did not modify those VDPPs to coincide with the ultimate plan location for Minnesota Beach Road. And staff determined we need to update the index map if we are gonna update those two uh, VDPPs, which are the other two items are on the agenda. So since we're making those changes, I personally thought it was appropriate to show the potential sites on Minnesota Beach Road, where a school site may be added. There's a note on that that says these are shown here, just like the existing 60 acres, and that they may be subject to a future contract, future due diligence period. But I want everybody to understand what we're thinking, what we're talking about. We're showing the water plant just further to the west. So this way, everybody gets a good glimpse of what we're planning today. Will we update that index map in the next six to 12 months? Absolutely, because we're working on another village which may have a bundled golf component, and we're gonna to have to come in with a VDPP. And there'll be something in that VDPP that will necessitate an updated index map. Thank you for the clarification. Um, so, as you're working toward bringing closure to what was done in the past before you came in, um, are you learning where some of those discrepancies that citizens feel that they're finding, are you digging into those discrepancies to see if there was something that maybe wasn't transpired properly or has legal told you everything is legitimate uh, that has gone on. You, it's just you do it the green way or you do it the red way type of. As Mr. Severn spoke uh, during the public comments, we have asked Madame's chief corporate counsel to look into it. We have asked the West Villages Improvement District Council to look into it. 
They have had many discussions. They have looked at all the documents. They have said point blank, everything was done according to the documents. It was a real estate transaction. Could have been done differently. Possibly. <coughs> That's why this new deal is being done as a straight transaction just between the two property owners, not bringing in a third party. It's just cleaner that way. We believe everything was done according to all applicable laws. It was done legally, legally. but you may not yourself have done it the same way. Um, the appearance that I'm getting with some of the ex parte communications that I had, uh, phase one uh, did pay out for purchase of properties and stuff. So in bringing closure to these discrepancies, is that going to be viewed in the future as transactions happen? Any consideration toward transactions by the citizens? I is cannot honestly question. answer that at this moment. I'm sorry? I can't really okay. answer that honestly at this moment. OK, thank you. Uh, I believe that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not really sure who to address this question to. Um, so I watched the school board meeting. Um, and it's my understanding the Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands is selling the property, that 130 acres, to the school board that's in Village K. That's correct. The 60 acres that's just near the baseball field um, that's owned by the school board, is the school board selling that back to yes. Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands? Yes, it's all one contract. Okay. So... The $10 million that they had spoke about, does that include the 60 acres? Yes, or is that, that is the net number. The net number, thank you very much. So the money f that Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands will be receiving for the 60 acres by the baseball field, will that be dispersed to the people that had already that, pay paid in? That is not the intent. Just like if you were to sell your house today, you wouldn't give part of those that income to the yeah, person. Yeah, because it you was West it. Villages that sold it. Right. Okay. Um, on those contracts, and can I just one second? We're going to net ten million from that sale. Just so you understand, we're going to spend about twenty-five million just putting in the road, sewers, irrigation, and water main to that school site, plus. A lift station, which we're in the process of working on a lift station optimization plan with uh, the utilities department here. So this is not a big gain for us in terms of cash. It is a positive long term for the West Village's Welland Park neighborhood to have a K through eight, a high school site anchoring the community, and that's the main reason we're doing it. It's good community planning. Thank you. The, 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 I've heard the public comment. I've received the emails about how one group of residents paid for that 60 acres towards the West Village's Improvement District, used that money to, to get the school mm -hmm. property. The city of Northport, were we party to any no. of those agreements? No, we were not. At all? The city of Northport had nothing to do with the agreements between the West Village's Improvement District, the, the property owners out there with their inner workings and dealings. That's correct. We had no, no part in this. Thank you. Are we party to, is the city of Northport involved in any way with the purchase of this property with Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands and the Sarasota County School Board? Not at all. So this I got is a phone call out from them asking about the zoning on it. That's okay. about it. <laughs> and the zoning's fine. Yes. Okay. Um, so this sounds like it's an issue between the West Villages Improvement District, Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands, and the citizens of the West Villages Improvement District. That's correct. It's probably the, not even including the West Villages Improvement District because they do not own either of the two properties. Okay. It's between the Welland Park LLP 
and the concerned citizens. Gotcha. Um, there was mention in some of that ex parte communication about impact fee credits. What impact fee credits? Yeah. As part of this prior deal, Minnesota Beach Road received money for the purchase of the property from WVID and received impact fee credits from the school district, which obviously then we were able to sell to home builders building in unit one, which covered their school impact fees. Okay, so the school impact fees has nothing to do with the city of Northport. That's between the property owner, I'm sorry, the property owner and the school the district. property owner and the school board. Correct. We don't collect those fees. We do not use those fees. We physically collect them, but just then as we a came back. Gateway. We're we're passed through. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we collect them, but immediately whatever we collect immediately gets turned around Correct. and sent to the school board as their impact fees. It's not our impact Correct. fees. Okay. All right, before we go on to the next round of questions, because I know Commissioner Carasone, you said you had more. I did receive another public comment card, unfortunately, because this is quasi-judicial and that portion of this process has been closed. I cannot hear the public comment. All right, Commissioner Carasone. Um, I'm glad I'm I was going to actually hit on some of the things you were talking about because I was, I too was, I heard that 3.65 impact fee credit, but it doesn't really, it doesn't so much affect us as it does the, as the uh, school board, so. Um, however, what did kind of tingle my senses was when you said that you had to build infrastructure, the roadway, Minnesota Beach Road specifically. Are you going to be looking for the city's impact fees, transportation impact fees, to build that roadway? Well, as you know, the annexation agreement and the prior agreements with the city do contemplate uh, impact fee credits for roadways. We need to work out that process. Mm -hmm. None of the roads to date have received any impact fee credits from the city. No, not true. No. But go on. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we've asked for some of the roads that have been built. Uh -huh. We have not. And we're working on an agreement with it like we did with the post-annexation agreement. Huh. But more than likely, those come after, you know, what the final road cost is. We do have the road plans designed. They're ready to go. And we but without... Develop. Without the road, you don't access the school, correct? Unless you ask, access it internally, then there's no... No, we'll need to build the road to access the property. It's a couple thousand feet east of the River future road. extension of West Village Drive. West Village Parkway, which was extended here earlier this year, ends about 1,400 feet north of the future intersection with Minnesota Beach Road. The same as with Prado. So at and some point we'll tie Prado, West Village's Drive with Minnesota Beach Road, and then obviously continue to River Road. And you know, yeah, I was going to say it all connects up it to all, River it Road. All connects, and, and it'll and, basically go to but, our west property line and wait till the county comes. Right, from the but west. the other side is going all the way through uh, to River Road. Bender, uh, Pat Neal's place, the golf course, the, all the way up to Venice. Ultimately, the, the long-term well, plans. Pat Neal, Boca Royale is yes. much further south than Manitoba. But it's all going to connect is what I'm trying to in get at. In some fashion, it will. No, it's, it's in there. It's in it, part of long-term It's not part of Minnesota plan. Beach Road. It would connect with Keyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ultimately, but different, yes. Different roadway, but it will, Keyway will ultimately tie to Prado and the southerly extension of West Village's Parkway. So, with that said... Um, the Minnesota Beach Road will most likely be a major roadway that will connect Venice, Inglewood, Northport, probably parts of Port Charlotte due to West, um, Winchester, 
it is intended to be a two-lane roadway, most of the width from River Road to 776 per the all the traffic studies. So it will be um, a collector, but it's not going to be a major highway. Am I looking at the Minnesota Beach Road that runs off of 41 has always been intended to go through uh, to Keyway, which is well up beyond through Sarasota County. So unless things have changed, which they, uh, listen, it's been a while. Would you put a picture of the index map up on the board? Yeah. For the, the problem is it doesn't reach all the way over where I'm talking about. You know what I mean? This way, then it, it will ultimately go to Keyway uh, through Sarasota National. They dedicated or sold land to the county, so west of us, Island Walk would have to build a little piece of uh, Minnesota Beach Road, and then the county from Island Walk to 776, which. I don't know where it's going to connect to 776. Yeah, That's our picture doesn't go out. that far. I know. That's but it's there's an existing two-lane intersection right there. Yeah, right it across the down, street from Minnesota re Beach Road. Relocated to the north of it, and it comes down on a curve. Saves. It was a dirt road. It's a dirt road. Yeah, it's where that. the strawberry farm was. I live there. That's I know exactly where it is. Um, so... I guess what my point is, is that we're talking about all the different portions mm -hmm. putting in, um, and how many impact fee credits are we talking here? I don't know, man. Because now we talk about impact fee credits. Well, from, from our standpoint, the only roads that are impact fee credit. You need to talk doing. closer to the mic. I'm sorry. Uh, West Villages Parkway, Prado, and uh, Minnesota Beach, Beach Road. And River Road. River Road's not your roadway. Uh, but Can we I had to dedicate several of our impact right. fees to it. Thank you. We weren't so, party to that document. Yeah. Well, actually, you were originally. You weren't here. Um, so... So as much as we're going to gain, and this is to staff, in changing out this acreage, are we going to lose it by having to give impact fee credits back? Because we all know that giving the impact fees back is essentially us purchasing that um, infrastructure. Ultimately, I would say no. One, the impact fees that we, if, if we come to an agreement on an impact fee credit amount, mm -hmm. it would only be for impact fee credits or impact fees that we receive in the West Villages. Which is? Which can only be used at this point in time in the West Villages. A percentage, right. No, oh. mm -hmm. Right. So that being said, the increase in taxable property that we would have, having the town center property be added back to the books, um, as you know, impact fees are highly restricted in what they can be used for, mm -hmm. whereas the revenue from that property is not. And it would be ongoing and forever as opposed to a one-time payment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You know I hate this school here, right? I, I don't know how many times i got to mention it because yet again... You're not serving Northport. You're serving Inglewood. I'm done. Commissioner, did you have any follow-up questions? I do not. They've all been answered. Thank you. I just have one because it brings up a great point about those impact fee credits for transportation. Those transportation impact fees, we have already designated X percentage to be used every single year to build River Road. That was our agreement up to a, a specific dollar amount. And if I had known we were going to be talking about this, I would have brought my documents with me. But I have to wonder how much is left to help build a road for Minnesota Key. Well, 
again, if there's any money left, it probably doesn't even get used to Minnesota Beach Road. It gets used in other roads. So the impact fees for the, the river road widening, we paid $2 million up front, mm -hmm. which had already been collected. Correct. And 50% of future collections Correct. up to a total of $6 million, mm -hmm. um, not to exceed the $6 million. Impact fee credits would also be, you know, if that, again, this is an if, because that agreement isn't finalized, we're not done. Um, commission hasn't even seen anything yet because we're not anywhere near bringing something to you all. For Minnesota to be true. For anything no, big up the there. Fee the impact fee credits that were referred to in an agreement would come from West Village's impact fees for any of the roads that would meet the definition of a public road. That hasn't been ironed out yet. We are in very early stages of that, so it's nowhere near ready to come to you all. Um, and that's out of 50%, though, right? Again, not even anywhere near being able to tell you anything about that because we are at such an early stage on that. But again, that would be impact fees collected up there. The you know, I will not bring you an agreement that says it will come from impact fees collected anywhere else in the city to benefit a separate mm -hmm. section of the city. So right. those credits would be limited to what is collected in the West Villages. Just like the rest of the developer agreement we have, um, for example, I'll just use the fire station because that's always been our example, is if they don't get, if they spend $10 million to build a fire station up there and the city only collects $6 million up there for fire, fire impact fees, losses on them, not on us. Same situation would apply to this. Thank you. Hey. I have no other questions. Thank you. So, can Carson. I follow up on what you're saying? Well, first of all, we have used impact fees from other areas to essentially help build this particular area. So that's been done in the past. Um, roadways, uh, water utilities, uh, I mean, you name it, it's all been fronted by the city, given an impact fee credit, uh, except for, of course, some of it was purchased or built by the, the yeah. developer. But I guess my point, uh, when Bobcat paid impact fees, some of that money had to be used, or when Heron Creep paid impact fees, some of that money had to go towards Toledo blade widening. So in the past, until case law made it different, yes, that was that was pretty regular thing that you... We have new case law in right. place now. No. I'm going by that now. That said, with that said, <laughs> what I'm trying to get at, what I'm trying to get at is that we talked about having a new justification study for impact fees to, to detail the percentage of the overall use citywide um, the use within such a radius that those impact fees are collected. That's what's being worked on right now. Thank you. That is what I'm trying to get at. And, and that's why, like I said, the, the agreement for that we're working on with them is in such an early stage that it's not even worth talking about right now. Well, Because that study has to be done. The impact fees have to be calculated. How much relates to the system as a whole? Right. How much relates to the West Villages um, specifically? All of that is being worked on right now. I guess what I'm trying to add to that, which I know you're going to love me for, Not is like that me. when you're dealing with something like Minnesota Road, there should be also an allocation of how much of that use is really going to be from West Villages or that area versus other areas of unincorporated Sarasota County or Charlotte County to determine what the cost. All that can be factored you in. You get one of yep. Okay, thank you. That's what I want to make sure is the <coughs> Any other questions? That was a good conversation. Thank you very much. Seeing no other questions, we will move on to closing arguments, and that starts with staff first. <coughs> staff has no closing arguments. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the applicant, it's your turn for closing arguments, please. Thank you. Uh, Katie Labar with Stantec. We have no further comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. At this point, I will entertain a motion. Uh, so we're going to do this in three separate yes, motions. Yes, we have to do them three separate motions, yes, because they're three different specific items, even though we combined it. So our the judicial hearing process is closed, and now we'll do motions one at a time, starting with the ordinance for the um, 
2020-16. Thank you. Uh, I'll move to approve ordinance number 2020-16 as presented. No. I'll second. Got a motion on the floor to approve ordinance number 2020-16 as presented, made by Vice Mayor, seconded by myself. Vice Mayor, do uh, you want to speak to it? The thing, the issues that have been brought up don't really have to do with the city. It has to do with other entities. And with the index map can be changed around in the future. Um, I have no problem in passing this at this point in time. Thank you. Um, and my comments are very similar after hearing that we are not party to any of the past agreements um, with either Manasota Beach Ranch Lands or West Village's Improvement District and the school board. There's no reason to hold up approving a index map. We're, we're not party to any of these agreements, past or future. So. Um, regarding the sale or purchase of those properties. So, um, Commissioner Carrison, did you want to weigh in? As you know, I'll state it again, I hate this school being, the schools being where they're located because this is going to not benefit Northport. It's just not. It, you'll, you'll have those who live in the area in West Villages and that will be a benefit to Northport, but I just, I have such major heartburn over that part because it's going to give them the justification to not build in Northport. That's what's going to happen. They will say they just built two brand new schools in Northport and where the majority of people who live here who would be using those school systems will ultimately be screwed. With that said, Jesus, um, I get that, you know, this can all change. And the odds of them building by 2024 is slim to none because nothing in government works fast. Um, and I agree with you, Vice Mayor. I, you know, the, the things that were put in here as disputes and that's that... It really, we have no party in that. You, there, if there's a legal issue, that's between them and their district and their board and what have you. So it has no bearing on this quasi-judicial procedure. Um, unfortunately, you can't, you can't vote with your heart or your judgment when it comes to quasi-judicial. You have to vote in the law. You have to vote with the legal rights. You have to vote with what you are legally acceptable. And so with that said, I have to vote that way. And that's it. And just so you, I just have to say that regardless of where the school is built, whether it be right south of, in the current location where the school property is, if the school board needs to build a high school, they're gonna build it there and they're gonna do it there. Regardless if they move it, what, two, three miles south, it's still going to count as a school in Northport. Oh, the, well, no. Yeah, because it's still in Northport, no. right there by this. Where I was showing them, it, it wasn't was in Northport. Out. It was outside of the city of Northport city limits. I got you. Now. And that was about the taxable value. Got you. Now. But you're right. The, I mean. <laughs> All right, so let's call the question. Um, seeing no other comments. All right, Vice Mayor is the motion maker. Yes. Um, a yes as the seconder, and Commissioner Carousel. Yes. And that passes three to zero for the index map. Moving on to Village F. I'll move to approve ordinance number 2020-14 as presented. Uh, and I'll second that. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, everything that was needed or addressed and the previous meeting is addressed, so I'm fine. Thank you, and I have no comment. I appreciate you taking care of the concerns that we had from first reading. Thank you. Commissioner Carasone, anything? Nope. All right. We'll go ahead and call the vote. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. I'm a yes. Commissioner Carasone? Yes. Thank you very much, and that passed three to zero. Moving on to the next ordinance, number 2020-15 for Village G. I'll move to approve ordinance number 2020-15 as 
And I'll go ahead and second that motion on the floor to approve ordinance number 2020-15 as presented for second reading, seconded by myself. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. And I have no comment. And Commissioner Carasone? Good. Thank you. We'll go ahead and do voice vote. Vice Mayor? Yes. And myself, yes. Commissioner Carasone? Yes. And that passed three yes. to zero. Um, I know that the residents are still out there. I want to thank them for coming out um, to today's meeting and uh, voicing your concerns. Um, wish you well in your endeavors. And at this point, it is now 3.35. We are going to take a 10-minute break to 3.45. Thank you. All right.
Hello, everybody. We're back. It is now 3.55. At 4 o'clock, we're going to be hearing our proclamations and rec recognitions. We do have two items left on the agenda to address. Um, I'd like to discuss with the will of the, the board, the one item is discussion and possible action regarding the posting of emails to the city website. Seeing this was put in by the city clerk who is absent, maybe we should just pull this for a future agenda item to discuss later since she's not here to really present it. We're having a conversation with the person that would be doing it, not being able to weigh that, in. That's so. a good point. She's hugging and kissing babies right now. <laughs> and I don't blame her. I, I agree, but furthermore, about the right-of-way use, shouldn't we wait till we have a full board for that? Because that's something that has been a problem for some time that the whole board kind of weighed in on for multiple meetings. But I mean, I would I would right? actually like to have it discussed. We could discuss it further if we need to, but uh, Anthony uh, is ready to address it right now too, or okay. clarify some things okay. or give us information. Okay. So, uh, so let's get a motion to pull item eight A, and that's the discussion um, regarding the emails um, for a future commission meeting. So if I could get a motion on that, please. So move. Second. Motion on the floor to um, postpone discussion about posting emails on the city's website to a future meeting to be determined by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Carison. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Commissioner Carison. And I appreciate y'all letting me have that conversation because I think it's in everybody's best interest, including our city clerks. So we'll go ahead and do voice vote on that. Um, Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Carison? Yes. And I also am a yes. So that will be postponed to another meeting. All right, so do we need to get a motion about the sheds or is it agreed as by consensus we're just gonna continue with the sheds? Yeah. Continue with the sheds, okay. All right, so we have about three minutes. So we will recess for three minutes and then we'll go downstairs uh, down below and, and do our proclamations and, and recognitions. So we have to do it a little bit differently. Um, normally the way we would do proclamations and recognitions is we would call the employees or the entity up, um, read the proclamation, shake hands, all that kind of stuff because of COVID. We can't do that. Um, so whoever is here to call, to be part of that proclamation, you guys can stand in front of us. We'll stand up here, read the proclamation, kind of air high five, and then you guys go back to your whatever you were doing. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that this is the sign of the times, but we also have to be cognizant of what's going on in the world around us. Um, and the same thing will apply for um, recognitions. So when we call the proclamation up, if you guys want to stand down here, of course, social distancing and all that. If you don't feel comfortable, you're welcome to stand back there too. It's up to you guys. Um, but we got to find a, a new way of doing this. All righty. So I've spoken enough, and we've got like one minute. So we'll just hold off for a second or two, and then at 4 o'clock we'll start our proclamations because it's time certain. So we should recess Just sit here for a minute in silence. Sure. Have a moment of silence. Okie dokie. Hmm. Oh, okay. Is there a staff member going to take a picture? Sure, we can get somebody to take a picture. <clears throat> City clerk, I have on here uh, recognized the blood bank, but I have nothing. I have nothing for the rodeo, and I have nothing for the Public Works um, 2000. 19 stormwater improvement project. I, I don't have anything on that. Is that going to be done by staff, city manager? 
Okay, yes, staff is going to take care of those things. What about the blood bank one? We got it. Okay, just making sure. All righty, guys, it's 4 o'clock. We get to do proclamations and recognitions. The first one we're going to do is the Parks and Rec Month. So all of those from Parks and Rec, if you want to come on down and stand right here. Hey, look at that. 4 o'clock. One ringy dingy. Hey, hey. That's because it was my phone, not my alarm. <laughs> Thank you. Cute top. Red, white, and blue outfit. You guys are all set for the 4th yeah. of July, huh? <laughs> all righty. So proclamation. This is whereas the parks and rec programs are an integral part of communities throughout this country, including the city of Northport. Whereas our parks and recreation are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our communities, ensuring the health of all citizens and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of the community and region. Whereas parks and rec programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic diseases, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who are mentally or physically disabled, and improve the mental and emotional health of all citizens. Whereas parks and rec programs increase a community's economic prosperity through increased project property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, and the attraction and retention of businesses and crime reduction. Whereas the parks and rec areas are fundamental to the environmental well-being of our community. Whereas parks and natural, natural recreation areas improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of the air we breathe, provide vegetative buffers to development, and produce habitat for wildlife. And whereas our parks and natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children and adults to connect their nature and recreate outdoors. Whereas the U.S. House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, and the city of Northport recognizes the benefits derived from parks and recreation re resources. Now, therefore, we, the City Commission of the City of Northport, do by here proclaim July 2020 as Parks and Recreation Month. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will get this to you. Thank you. Hi, Bob. Laura, did you get your picture? I did get my picture. Okay. Uh oh, you got to come back. We got to get pictures. I thought she was working with that phone. Uh -huh. No one's counting you. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Commissioner Carasone. Uh, I think that the group that this is being presented to wanted to say something. I'm not sure. They're always allowed to speak after you present. Yeah, so. true. Okay. So anyone here with the organization for um, Holly's Hope and uh, the Safe Alternative Graduating Ceremony? The Mass Bandit. <laughs> I thought Joan was going to come. She had um, something in the blood bank. Oh, okay. oh, we got the hey, blood, bank blood bank right bank. here. Okay, well. <laughs> and then I think the students were here they were in the public to collect uh, Food? Because oh. I'm hungry. Just <laughs> All right. Need my eyeballs. Um, there you go. Whereas each spring marks the graduation of high school seniors and more than 1,000 students will graduate from Northport High School and Imagine High School this year. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused cancellations of prom and all traditional graduation ceremonies which has said in loved ones and graduates. And whereas we recognize the resiliency and the many achievements of these graduating seniors, therefore Holly's Hope residents, businesses of Northport and its surrounding area have organized a safe alternative graduating ceremony with social distancing following CDC guidelines to take place on July 16, 2020. While, uh, whereas all persons, businesses, civic organizations, and governmental representatives who have supported and or planned the alternative graduation recognize that Northport's graduating seniors' commitment to academic achievement is the cornerstone of the city's 61-year history and future. 
Now, therefore, we, the city commission of the city of Northport, Florida, do hereby proclaim July 16, 2020, as Northport's Northport graduating class of 2020 day, and wish to thank all of those involved in reducing the emotional and mental impacts that our children caught children have been caused by this unprecedented time in history. All right, did you want to speak about it? Um, so I just want to thank your staff. Your, your guys' staff has been incredible. Um, Sherry Ouellette and every one of you guys that have worked with her to help us make this happen, we appreciate you guys. We know that this is a big burden. We know that this is a lot to take on. We know that we're asking for a lot. And for that, we apologize and thank you greatly. July 16th will be graduation. It will start at 9.30 with the first group. It's 75 kids per group. They're allowed to bring two guests with them. We will have it all safely spaced out, distanced. We have volunteers who will be cleaning the stairs. This is they will be temperature checked when they come in. This is even close to ready. I appreciate what you're saying. I have serious concerns with this because it's not been approved. You're making a lot of statements that staff hasn't signed off on yet. Okay. So you're, there's a lot of assumptions in what's going on here that this is even going to happen here. Okay. Um, that there's no nothing in the proclate. I know, but saying that staff has done all these things, you. we have not. Okay. We are working with you, but right. there's a whole lot missing, and there's a whole lot that has to happen before this can even move forward. So I want to make sure that. Stating a date and place is going to be tough. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Not a problem. <laughs> Thank you. We'll get you the proclamation. When it's signed by the rest. Thank you. All right. So at this time, we'll turn it over to the city manager regarding the public works for the receipt of the Florida chapter of the American Public Works Association 2019 project of the year for the Deming Stormwater Improvement Project. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Belia, our Parks and Work Public Works Director, is going to come down. Why don't you guys have to stand? Like, seriously? Because <laughs> they're your proclamations. <laughs> Whatever. It's the city proclamation. Why don't you guys come on? And that way then we can kind of get pictures and make sure you... Go ahead, whenever you're ready, Ms. Julie, we'll turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Mayor, thank you, Commission. Um, the uh, Public Works Department, we identified uh, one of the oldest areas in the city, um, Deming Avenue, that had a uh, extremely, um, extremely complicated and, and very bad drainage issues for many, many years. Uh, the homes in, in, on that street were built in the 50s and 60s, so they had the uh, inverted driveways in that area. And what our staff did in-house is they did the design, they did the permitting, uh, worked with engineering, and they um, dug out all the swales, and they put in what's called trench boxes within the driveway areas so that the water can drain into the pipes and that the water can uh, then uh, flow um, out to the, the nearest drainage ways and, and off the street. Uh, the homeowners were extremely happy. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting with them and um, it, it solved a very long-standing issue in the neighborhood. So that being said, uh, we submitted for an APWA, American Public Works Association, award, and we won. Uh, back in February, we received, <laughs> we received the uh, uh, Stormwater Project of the Year from APWA, myself and Assistant City Manager Yarborough and uh, Chuck Speak, our Operations and Maintenance Manager. Uh, we went and we, we, we uh, picked up the award. <laughs> Uh, but definitely the credit goes to the operations and maintenance staff that did the work. Uh, it was a very hard, complicated project. And I'd also like to recognize the Northport Utilities Department staff that assisted us because there were some complications with regard to utility relocations and so forth. So we appreciate it and they deserve the credit. Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak? Go ahead, 
Did you guys get a plaque or anything? We did, but we forgot it. Sorry. <laughs> well, congratulations, guys. Okay, was it nice pretty? job. Nice job. Was it pretty? <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I would. Next. <laughs> All righty, so then we'll move on to the recognition rodeo. of the 2020 Public Works Rodeo Skills Competition for the Operations and Maintenance Division of Solid Waste. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commission. Um, back in uh, February, we had our annual rodeo, and each year at our rodeo, we have various types of skill set, uh, skill set type competitions. So we had two teams that competed against one another, and of course one of the teams won. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and read off the names uh, from the Operations and Maintenance District, the, or excuse me, Operations and Maintenance Division, Don Kelsey, Jeff Carlson, Archie Ruiz, Brent Stevenson, and Tara Musselman. Those were the winners in, in the, uh, the skill set competition. I guess. Now on our solid waste division side, um, the uh, equipment operators, they also compete in skill set uh, competition. And we had two, two winners. First place is Paul Healy with 250 points. And then also we had Alicia Ramirez, he finished second place with 245 points. Now, they have been uh, moved on to go to the North uh, Solid Waste Association North America competition, mm. uh, state competition, which was to be held in April, but unfortunately that's been delayed due to COVID. But hopefully that will be rescheduled soon. So congratulations. Don't lose your skills. <laughs> <laughs> I got a feeling they practice a bit. Yeah. They do. <laughs> These names are becoming routine. Uh -huh. yes. 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 I have you guys are getting to know them. Yes, it's a competition we are. Three between three you. Yes. We have to wonder if it's fixed at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. Great job, you guys. Okay. Great Do they want to speak? You guys want to talk? No. No? <laughs> Frankie, you want to say anything? But thank you very much. You know, the competition uh, shows off the driver's best skills and the safest drivers, and these two show it every day. Yep. So, congratulations. Nice. Thank you very much. Nice. Yeah, nice. Awesome. Good job, guys. Oh, oh. I didn't get to drive a truck this year at the rodeo, though. Oh, next year. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Driving it. Thank you. All righty. So our next one is to recognize the Suncoast Blood Bank. Woohoo! Woohoo! Oh, good. Okay. Alex, come on up here, please. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, back in late February of this year, um, I actually had a meeting at the city manager's office early in the morning. And when I got there, the city manager and about four or five different staff members were there. And I just knew something terrible had happened. Uh, there had been a very, very bad accident with two of our employees, um, one of which is Alex's dad. And um, from there, uh, of course, we, we had to see you know, what was going on and, and what their well-being was going to be. But one of the things that the employees needed, particularly Alex's father, was blood. So very early the next morning, uh, city manager contacted all the directors and said, we need to get together a blood drive and we need to get mm -hmm. together quickly because a lot of blood transfusions are needed. Um, by Tuesday morning, uh, Suncoast Blood Center, Mr. 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 Charles Kane, and also hit many of his staff turned room 244 into the most amazing, mm -hmm. amazing blood donation center. Uh, it was so packed. I was in a meeting in the chambers. I tried three times to get in. Yeah. I couldn't. There were so many people getting blood. It was just awesome, awesome. Um, actually, there were so many people, we had to run a second day. Yeah. They mm -hmm. graciously ran a second day. Um, here at the city of Northport, we're like family, our employees. Yep. And we cannot express the gratitude and appreciation for what you guys did. 
Amen. So for that, thank you so much. There's a clap. And this, this, is, um, this is Victor's son, and I have, I'm sorry that I have not been able to get your the get well card. Oh, thank you. <laughs> for your father. So, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to extend out my heartfelt thank you to everyone who was able to come and donate on those days and to help us coordinate. And there were people downstairs helping us roll equipment upstairs. Uh, we're trying to put it together. The, the donations that came out for food to, to supply the, the, the donors for that day and the, and the following day. Um, it speaks volumes about the quality of your employees and the conditions under which they work that they rally uh, with such uh, force and the, that act of kindness, that act of generosity and support are so important now more than even ever. Mm -hmm. And I just want to extend out that thank you to you and then to do a plug, remind you, 56 days are up, so I want to see you all back. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, did you want to say anything? Thank you all for everything you did and thank you for what you do. Thank you. Yeah. Your dad's doing better? Got home yesterday. Yes. 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 Just a few minutes here. Wow. Nice. Yes. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Very in a few minutes will be the first time you've seen him in months. Oh Since lockdown, yeah. Wow. 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 Oh, well, thank That's you for right being with us. Yeah. You can go. Bye. Go see him. Tell him we said hello. Bye. Thank, thank you, so everybody. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Nice job. That's it. All righty, so uh, that's all for the proclamations and recognitions. So now we're going to move on to our shed. So this is a discussion and possible action regarding the right-of-way use permits and fees for our shed. So city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this actually came as a request um, from Vice Mayor Luke, and our building official is also here to discuss it. So I'll let Whoever wants to go first, go first. Uh, go ahead and introduce it, Vice Mayor. During, um, uh, there's been a couple of times we've had a discussion <laughs> of Double? people having problems with um, finding discrepancies within the decision that we made. And it, it took a while to get to that point of mm -hmm. where we wanted the sheds to be. Uh, I remember one meeting, Commissioner Hanks brought it up in a meeting because he had received a Facebook message or that of everything that they had to go through in order to get their building or their shed permit. Mm. But I believe that shed was one that was constructed, so of course that will have a lot of ins and outs uh, to that. But that caused me to look into what was going on. And then a post that appeared uh, on our Facebook page and stuff, so I dug into it. Um, so I had a, a meeting with Anthony, and I believe Mr. Miles was in on it, and Katrina, I believe, was too. And so we had a discussion, and one of the uh, things that Anthony was uh, tag to do when he came in was to set a, a procedure of how to handle sheds 120 feet and square feet and smaller. And he wasn't aware, I don't believe, that the commission had said we wanted it to be 200 square feet and under. Uh, the okay. fees that we just looked at during budget time, it, it had the little thing that Right. 200 feet or less, uh, you get into the road and drainage right of way and it's exempt for 200 feet and less. Uh, but during this discussion that I had with Anthony, um, I think it would behoove us to listen to what he, his experience uh, has, well, the experience he has gained through his years of doing his position and his job and why he came up with what he did for the 120 and less. To me, it sounded like the same thing that we said for 200 and less. <laughs> oh. But I would love to have the rest of the commission to hear uh, him discuss that. So, Anthony, please. Anthony Warren, building official. Um, I would like to apologize if I um, 
showed up in the city of Northport and caused some um, miscommunication um, with the shed um, policy. Um, but what was presented to me anything, at the time um, was that right of way use permits and the fee for that right of way use permits was um, elected at 200 square feet and above. And I was um, not making any attempt to change that. Um, what I wanted to clarify is how do we review those shares that are under 200 square feet? Um, you mean 200 or less? 200 or less. 200 or less. <laughs> <laughs> um, in that, my determination has been before my previous jurisdiction is as the building official, there's no need for a plans examiner to be involved in a pre-built shed um, plan review. Um, it doesn't God. do any benefit for the customer, any benefit for the big box stores, or any benefit for the building <laughs> official to review a pre-built shed at 120 square feet. Now, Wait, where does the 120 square feet come from? This is what we're trying to, I wanted to explain. Um, and it's still not, has any direct connection to 200 square feet. That never changes. It's just, hey, if it's 120 square feet or less, a plan review by the building official and his plans examiners is not needed or required. The 120 square feet, um, and I spoke on this earlier, in order for me to get a license or a plans examiner to get a license or an inspector to get a license, they have to pass the international building code to get a certification past the Florida statutes to get a Florida license. The only thing we're testing on in the state of Florida is license, not code. However, <laughs> the building code, the Florida building code is this, is modeled off, off of the international code, but it's not 100% to 100%. It's the international code and the Florida building code took 90% of that and made the Florida building code and added their own 10% for the state of Florida. All right, so the international code states a permit isn't required for a shed 120 square feet. That's where I get my number, direct number from. It could be 64, it could be 86, it could be 96. Each jurisdiction comes up with their own determination on what that is. So um, Hillsborough County, it, it may be 96. Charlotte County is 100 square feet. So all these numbers are coming. Where are they getting those numbers from? Um, honestly, it's their, that building official decision of what he thinks um, can cause um, a danger to life, safety, and health. My number was because there's a number given by a test that I take that says 120 square feet. So that's where the 120 square feet came from with me. Um, and that was only for a plan review regulated by the building um, department or the building official. Um, what I did have presented to me at the time was the city of Northport's um, standard operating procedures on how to carry out. And it was based off Unified Land Development Code, Chapter 53, Section 53-240, Accessory Structures. And it was a shared um, policy per the, build, the previous building official of 200 square, un, 200 square feet or less. And that operating procedure said someone had to come in, <laughs> submit an application, and it was going to be reviewed. It didn't say if it was five by five, 25 square feet. It didn't say if it was 60 square feet. It didn't say it was 120 square feet. What I did was clarify and say, guess what? This still holds true, but I don't want to see anything that's pre-built in under 120 square feet or less. So my policy was to say at 120 square feet or less, if it's pre-built, there is no need for a plans review. And what that also did was prompted me to get with Nicole, the planning manager, how does this affect your department and how this is gonna affect planning? Um, she still wanted a review, which is every right based off the land development code to make sure the people is gonna meet the correct setbacks. So how do we accomplish that? The new standard operation procedure stated, owner was going to have to submit an affidavit at time of uh, permit submittal stating that they were going to meet those required setbacks. 
and there will be a inspection and inspection by a zoning plans examiner to verify that. So to get a, um, a permit originally before I came in and made the suggestion, if it was five by five, six by six, whatever, you had to come in, submit an application and do a plans review on that. Now I'm saying anything that's 120 square feet is pre-built, you can come in, have your application and your affidavit and you walk out the door. A zoning plans examiner will go out at a time of inspection to verify the setbacks. So that's what was presented to be changed in there. But the fee itself, the right of way use permit, none of those was touched. It's still 200 square feet. Um, I, but I can see how people can get confused about, oh, if it's 200 square feet, it's 120 um, square feet. But they're, they're not referencing the same thing. Hmm? The 200 square feet is referencing a right of way use permit. Mm -mm. Nothing changes on the 120 square feet. 120 square feet. It's still the same thing. Can I? I am thoroughly okay. confused. So let, let me make sure I'm understanding what you're trying to convey. So if I come in and I want to have a 10 by 5 shed, it's 50 square feet. Yes. Right? And it's it holds my rakes and shovels. That's it. It's on the back of my house. Yes. I don't have to pay for any permit? No, that's not true. Okay, what, so what, what mm -hmm. permit do I have to pay for? You, you still have to pay for a permit. You still have okay. to pull a How permit. How much is that permit? Like $38 or something like that? All right, so mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. clarify, before I state this, I want to clarify. I didn't touch fees, so I know we're talking no, about we how know. much things cost. That was not... I didn't come in okay. and say about so fees, but I will tell you what it is. That's so a prefab shed, because that's my question. 120 square feet or less. There's an administrative fee of fifteen dollars, a convenience fee of three seventy five, uh, and okay. a zoning fee of twenty dollars, which is a total of thirty eight dollars and seventy five cents. Okay. Wait. Huh? Start over again, please. What was administration that? fee of fifteen dollars. Fifteen. A convenience fee of three dollars and seventy five cents. Uh-huh. And a zoning fee of twenty dollars. So then it's more okay. Total thirty-eight seventy-five. So if I want to just put up this little shed to hold my rakes, I have to come to the city of Northport and say, Hey, here's what I want to do to put my rakes in. It's on the back of my Lanai, not in my Lanai, it's next to my Lanai. Um, out of the way, and I have to pay the thirty-eight dollars, give an affidavit that it's not in the setback. You, yes, correct. You walk out the door. And I have everything I'm good. And then correct. the inspector comes and says, yay, McDowell was telling the truth. Everything is good. Correct. Now, what happens if it's over 120 square feet? All right. If it's over 120 square feet and pre-built, we right. have an administration fee of $15. Hmm. Now we have a building review fee, which is $15 also. Hmm. Now that we have a building review fee, we have those state fees that are attacked on to a building review fee. The first one is 23 cents, yeah, like which is education surcharge. Cents. The Building Code Administration Board's charge, which is $2. Mm -hmm. Department of Business Professional Regulations fee, which is $2. A convenience fee is $3.75. Here we go again. A zoning fee of $20. Total, $57.98. Mm -hmm. $57.98. That goes up to according up to two hundred. According to what I pulled the other day off of the website, it goes up to one hundred and ninety-nine square foot. Mm -hmm. It doesn't list two hundred square foot. Up to one hundred and ninety-nine. There was no right-of-way use permit in a um, a um, public but, works. But there is a building, and that's still true. Okay. There is no public works, and there is no um, right-of-way use. Right, but there is the uh, building. Go ahead, Mayor. That's all there's right. a building review fee, yes. So if I have a, if there's no such thing as a 199 square foot shed. I don't care how you try and slice that pie. It's a 10 by 20 shed, and that's a 200 square foot shed. Am I paying something additional than this less than 199 square feet? No. I'm sorry, say it again now. So if I have a 10 by 20 shed, that's 200 square feet. Mm hmm because there's no such thing as a shed being 199 square feet. It's, they have standard sizes. 10 yes, by yes. 20, 
what am I paying for a 10 by 20 shed that is $200? If it's 10 by 20, now you have the right of way use. And that's what was agreed that's before. That's before I got here. That's what's agreed before. That's it, what's in the ordinance. It, in all actuality, <laughs> it was agreed before the agreement that we came to. Which was 200 square feet. Before you got here. Mm -hmm. When, when feet we months. were here, we said 200 square foot and less exactly. was to be done the way the 120 square foot shed was. That's not what's that's not what's in your stand or not in the standing operation procedures I presented. Okay, it, it was not updated <laughs> after we voted it in because I have the ordinances showing yeah. where we passed 200 square foot and less. I on also, a right of way use. Correct. And there correct. is still no right of way use, so that's what I don't get. The ordinance stated right of way use on the anything under 200 square feet. There still isn't a right of way use added to it. Right. But you just said that if I have a 10 by 20 shed, which is 200 square feet, I have to pay a right of way use. And that's not true. We shouldn't have to. We said. I'm, I'm not following now. I guess I'm not following. 200, 200 square foot or less. Yeah, the ordinance doesn't say up to 200. It says 200 or less. So rather than stopping at 199, I would stop. Okay, at I'm just reading what was what you guys already had. I don't know. It says 200. That's what's in the ordinance from 2019 that she's referring to. Maybe what not you're reading SOP. is a procedure that was developed by yeah an independent person who did not follow apparently the follow what it was that was the commission's direction. That's right. That's it what wasn't you're reading. the latest update. Or chose to not. But I pulled off also off of the website just the other day uh, where it's talking about installing sheds under 200 square foot and installing non-structural sheds over 200 square foot. So it says under 200 square feet, right? Yep. So that's 199. But so it also both? says over 200. So there's discrepancies the even in this when somebody yes. pulls it up on the website. Then on the website also talks about prefab sheds, 120, uh, less than, less than 120 square foot. Yes. So it doesn't even count the 120. There are numerous. And we're talking about two different things here. We're, you guys are, oh, not you guys. We're, we're presenting <laughs> okay. right away use versus doing a, a plan review. It's two totally different things. Okay. Yes. But the code says no right of way use permit is required for any shed 200 square feet. A right or of way less. use permit. That's right. what I'm saying. A right of way use <laughs> permit for 200 square feet or less. Okay. But. <laughs> which, which it does. I'm, 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 I'm with you with that. There is no. <laughs> there they are. That it is not. The picture. Uh, it is. It is not charging the right of way use. I mean, those fees that we just looked at during budget time states that there's no right of way use, 200 square feet and less. We're in agreement there. Okay. But what we as a commission were discussing in that ordinance was that all sheds, 200 square foot and less, would be treated identical. So what you developed for that 120 and less, this commission's desire was for 200 and less, so that there was not this uh, extra state charges and stuff hmm. uh, being added on to it because of the building minimum permit fee under 400. So then the ordinance should have read a building permit, not a right of way use permit. Both. Now, the ordinance was consistent with very specific commission yes. direction related to 200 square feet or less, prefabricated without a hmm. slab, it's written almost word for word based on the commission direction. Correct. Now, the intent might have changed or there may have been a different intent on one or all of your parts than what the actual language was that was in the motion. But the ordinance is written and was approved in accordance with the motion and it relates specifically to the right-of-way use permit for sheds 200, not 199, but 200 and less. Well, so, F FYI, I look back at every single meeting from 2019 to 2018. And um, the right-of-way inspection fee at the time was fifty dollars. Get rid of it. And the uh, right, and we got rid of it. There was a forty-dollar building fee, and 
uh, a $55 plans review road and drainage fee. What we had said was you would not need the plans review. You would just come in with the survey or, hold on, survey or septic site. You would only need a building permit. Um, and that uh, I don't think, I, I'm pretty sure the right of way and the setbacks were the only concern that we weren't going to allow anything 200 or less in the right of way or setbacks. Well, it seems so, like one of the issues is dealing with the 199 versus 200. We can adjust the policy yeah, that's, very easily. Yeah, that's just an issue. I mean, I'm not but worried about But it's still one of the things you're talking about. I'm trying to cross them off one at a time so we can get through this. Yeah. Um, I'm not, that, that's an that issue. That's yeah. easy but fix. the intent of what we thought was being accomplished obviously wasn't. That's why I said I would like to get this discussed, you know, today and then maybe bring back uh, mm -hmm. again because the intent that we thought was being accomplished didn't get accomplished because there was still that larger char charge for the 120 to the uh, 200 mark. So what I can tell you is that in listening to the meetings, that was actually supposed to be dis discussed in that summer's budget hearings when we talked about the fee ordinance. And, and, it, um, and it never got done. Okay. All right. Because there is a $4.27 fee that we must pay. And when I asked, um, I can't remember who it was that was actually presenting at the time, uh, what is the minimum fee that we can get away with? I never got an answer. And that is my question. What is the minimum fee? If you're going to look at a piece of paper and make sure that it's not in the right of way per the piece of paper, you don't have to go out there to make sure that they didn't have it in the right of way because if there's a problem after the fact, you find them. You know, okay, they're not in compliance. Then that's when that part comes in. But again, the minimum fee for someone to come in, because I know there's a requirement for permits, you come in, here's my old survey from 2010, uh, this is where I'm putting a shed. Okay, pay the four dollars and thirty cents and be done. That's how I thought we were going to go do this. So, can I ask a question? Yes. So, because the building code has one set of rules, and the commission's desire, from what I'm hearing and from what prior conversations was. What you're doing for sheds for 120 square feet or less, can you do, based on the Florida Building Code, for a shed's 200 square feet or less? Yeah. The exact same thing with the $38.75 charge. My response would, to that would be, I could, but as the building official, I think a 200 square foot shed is too large for me to say I'm not worried about it. That's why I wanted my true him answer. to speak to it. Okay, so you're seeing two different structural um, buildings. Correct. I see 120 square feet as a holding rakes and shovels and maybe a, a push mower lawnmower. <clears throat> and that's probably what you see. But that's when correct. you see a 200 square foot shed, 10 by 20, that is a structural component. Correct, and that's how I see it. And that has a larger level of concern correct. that you want to put additional eyes on. I would agree with That's that. That's correct. Thank you for that clarity. I do agree with that. Okay. I, I want to clear about the fees. Um, and this spoke up, uh, stated before the last time we had um, a meeting about building fund fees being used for certain things. So if this, we're calling it a building permit, there are different permits. Mm -hmm. Rather, if everybody calls everything a building permit, there truly are different permits. A right-of-way use permit is not a building permit. So right. we don't have to charge the DBPR fee. We don't have to charge the building code administrative inspector. Well, that's boards. not what was presented. <laughs> so, but once we go and say, hey, we're going to get rid of the right-of-way use portion, guess what? We still have those building portions. Now we still have to charge those, those fees on there. That's an automatic. We can't the, just get, get rid but of But your realistic 
building fees. Yes. So in other words, and this was my argument before, yes. if you're literally going to go look at a piece of paper, then why are we paying $140? Yeah, I, I, I at understand. At the time, I understand. mind you. And I agree with you 100% right. up to 120 square feet. Right. And I, <laughs> listen, I, I'm yeah. not going to argue with you on that one because, um, to be honest with you, I think that we should bring back, and, and hopefully we'll get a consensus to that, to bring back the, the um, it was an ordinance, uh, and do a definition between a, 120, well, I don't know if 120 square feet, because an 8 by 6 Well, I, I do know at one point, during the history, I went through the history of what um, um, City of Northport was doing in the fall. Oh, before. dear Lord. Well, there was know. something that was 84 square feet, but I didn't, where did that come from? Uh, probably someone <laughs> who specifically had a problem, but um, what's an 8 by 6? Hold on. 8, 48. Uh, 48 yeah, square feet? I want to give you guys the other implications on this. Five six equals, and it can't be a six by six is one twenty. Six by six, six, by six, six is thirty six. Thirty six. So a one twenty is ten by twenty, which is a huge roof. And I spoke to that in those I, meetings. So uh, you got runoff. You yeah. know, whether I want to give you other 20. implications on, 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 feet was on not this. My so thing. We're talking about when you look at a plan review. Um, I'm looking at minimum building code requirements, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So if someone gives me something to look at, I'm looking at minimum, minimum building code requirements. So I want to say, what can I get away with? And I'm telling them they don't have to give me anything. Because once I look at it, now I'm looking at it for minimum building, building code requirements. Most of the sheds, and I have a statement from the Department of Community um, Affairs here, that state that most of the sheds at Lowe's, Home Depot, big box stores, they may not meet Florida Building Code requirements, but it's up to the local jurisdiction to make those decisions. <laughs> so they're telling homeowners that go to Lowe's, um, yep. Walmart, and get a shed, it's not going to meet Florida Building Then they're going to come to me and say, Anthony, you need to make sure. So now i got to tell the homeowner, you have to go out into an engineer, buy an engineer, and make sure this is engineered correctly. Oh, we know. That's where we have to think about all those things that go on. Correct. Which the engineering yeah, But once you get up to 200 square feet, that's it, to me is excessive. Again, I, but the engineering public thing works has every right to say they don't want to be involved in right away use for that size. So that's why I never wanted to even touch the two hundred square feet thing. Okay, that, well, they, you don't want to look at a, a part of our yeah, ordinance okay. <laughs> was that there was no right of way okay. use for two hundred and less. So yes. public works was not supposed to have yes. any part of it. Yes. So let's get back to the resolution. 120 square feet or less, no need for a permit. Well, no, you need a permit. You need a permit for zoning requirements. You need a very quick review. You don't need an engineer. Correct. You don't need any of that, right? Correct. Okay. 10 by 20 or a 200, between 200 and 120. Actually, anything One. over 120, you, I'm saying you need it at that point. Okay. I believe that 200 square foot, I'm okay with the building inspection fee. Yeah. I'm okay with the building inspection, but if you're going to go getting back into what we just got rid of, um, wood and drainage have to go in and re-inspect again for another hundred dollars. No, I'm not okay with that. So the right-of-way yes. use permit is because those larger sheds, larger than 10 by 20, has to traverse over the right-of-way. No, they don't. Because most sheds that are the smaller ones can be brought in over the property lines, up the driveway, and around the house. The larger sheds that are larger than the 10 by 20s, those usually have to be delivered through the right-of-way in between the two houses. Yes. And that's why they wanted the, the yeah. right of way use permit. And I, I don't have any problem. I just want to make sure that I yeah, wasn't. Because I had a 10 me by 20 trying to delivered on Get what I want to cross that I was going to step on public works toes. No, and 10 by 20, <laughs> they don't need the right of way use permit, Vanessa or Commissioner. You Tim. just said 10 by 20 needs the right no, of way. No, I did not. Okay, over then I by 10 by 20. <laughs> I misunderstood you because I thought you said a 10 by no, 20. Over needs 10 it. by 20 does. Anthony, can I ask a question? Uh, the 
the chart that you just read from, you know, the, the pricing and stuff like for, for the up to 120 and or less than 120 actually is what it states or 120 to what should be saying 200. Are you fine with the way that this is written in the code? If it were articulated without discrepancy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you fine with with how it appears? Uh, can you repeat it? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the chart that you read from, all the different things that are done, it says prefab sheds less than 120. Mm -hmm. I think our commission agrees that it should be 120 and less. And then prefab sheds 120, it says to 199, but we're saying okay, I get 200. What you're saying. Uh, are you okay with the way this is set up for those two? Um, no, I don't have a problem with that, no. Okay. As a building okay. official, you think that this procedure I, I get you. is all right? I understand. Can I ask okay. the question that what is the 120 um, square foot fee for I, I the read review? that off, I thought. Okay. cents. Okay, so it's $38.75 yes. in this proposed renewed manner that someone comes in gives you a piece of paper, you look at it, you stamp it, and they go away. You're saying that's $38.75. That is correct. And I will also and I would also say, guess what? The building department has nothing to do with that. It's a zoning fee and an administration fee. So that needs to be changed in the fee schedule, correct? Yeah. I would if that's what your goal is, yes. Can I ask, what is a zoning fee for? What is that for? What is the who? Zoning fee. Zoning fee is for the zoning plans examiner to do a, um, to go out to do an inspection to make sure that is. Um, Again, why? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, what, for the record, at 120 no, foot or less. For the record, Nicole Gale House Planning Division Manager. So for the zoning, for the 120 square feet, um, that falls into the zoning. What we did is we took that process, which used to be the same as the ones that are, you heard that were 121 to 199. All of that was the same. So it was $57.98. What we did, we took the building permit off and we said, how can we get this done the most efficiently? So right now they come in, they give us the permit application and an affidavit saying they understand where this has to be placed. We do not do a plans review on that shed now. Right. They get the permit and walk right out the door. So they're upfront, very quick, easy. On the back end, once they've placed the permit, my zoning staff goes out and does an inspection. If it were just setbacks, I might be a little bit more, you know, maybe we don't need that, but we're also looking at easements here. We wanna make sure that these aren't in the easements and aren't affecting stormwater runoff on a single family lot because they can't be in an easement. So it's not really a zoning fee, it's an inspection fee. It's a zoning inspection. Oh, it's a zoning inspection fee. Yes. but. But zoning has to do with neighborhood commercial exactly. commercial Exactly. Now residential. you're going back to road so and drainage fee. Zoning is, is much more than just, there's oh two God. different types of zoning. So one to change the title, I think, is what we're trying to get at. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get at the fact that this is a duplicative service being done. It, and we just took money away from the district for that permit and that, that inspection. So all we did was replace it in a zoning. No, no they were no. already being charged that fee. They were, they were being charged both. <laughs> you eliminated <laughs> one. Yes. Okay. And when we made our direction in January or November 1st, 2018, I believe it was, yep, that we said the only thing to be charged was for building, and that's it. Not zoning, not anything else just building listen to the meeting i just did today i was going to say i haven't listened to it recently but the way i recall it was that it was the right of way use permit no. that weren't yes. being applied that's all we took I, away was the right of way use permit that that is what i'm seeing in the minutes so the minutes minutes i don't away. even pay attention to because <laughs> they're half the time they're not even right listen to the meeting but that's the approved record i know i know I so know. because i was <laughs> I was I thinking. Know. I was thinking the intent was to remove the building, pretty much. Also, 
And so I went back and started looking at everything, and I'm like, nope, it was just the right of way. Yes, it was. But everything that he was doing for the 120, to me, the intent of this commission was, was that 200 or was less for 200 that. and less. Mm -hmm. uh, so to solve all the discrepancy and the di you know the various places that are you know different things being shown on the website, I thought we needed this discussion. You know, it needed his expertise to say there's a difference in the viewpoint of him at 120 square foot versus 200. And should we leave it, you know, as this and not bring something back to alter it, but leave the two variations of it up to that 100 square foot? Uh, for, every, for everybody's edification, the shed that would be, you know, 121 square foot up to the 200 would cost $57.98. And mm -hmm. somebody would still go out and view it, correct? From zoning? They're doing it for both. Yes, but there's um, building Seven. minimum permit fee under $4,000. What's that? That's $15 for that. So on the 121 to 199, that's where it triggers the, the $15 building fee. That's Preview. for the building structural permit review, yes. correct? On anything 120 and above, yes. Yeah, that's for the structural permit review. Yes. And then the other fee is the $2 and $2 and okay. whatever go with it. Tell me what the that is. What What's involved in the... Yeah. We have to um, verify the, the tie downs. Um, that's the main thing. So a pre truly the building code states that a prefab shed that was approved by the state of florida if they have that dca number we mm -hmm. only need to look at the foundation how it's tied down at the job site these weren't um, even supposed to have foundation of the down. tie down itself is a foundation if it goes on the slab that's considered a foundation um and that's what we're we're, we're looking at so any structure above 120 square feet, that's when I'm concerned about, are they using the right tie downs? If it's 120 square feet or less, I'm not as concerned about how it's tied down. So at minimum, we need to we need to do, look, and we're gonna stamp off on it and I'm sending the inspector out there to verify. We have to do that review. Okay. But yet again, <laughs> we're getting two reviews, correct? That's what's accounting for the 3875. For the 3875, there's no review being done. There's an inspection. Right. By both of you. No, no, no. just zoning. Just, just zoning. Yes. yes. When we directed building. There's no involvement in building at all. Mm. Watch the meaning. <laughs> all I can tell you is watch the meaning. Um, so... You want to clarify that we actually 200 and square feet or less. You guys can talk amongst yourselves because now I've got, I've got a totally different. <laughs> I think this. I has wanted to, to come state back. that um, prior to uh, me meeting with Nicole and the way we came up with it this particular time, we've actually made the fees less than what they were prior to my uh, arrival and making the suggestion. Um, I know we're still talking about fees, but it was actually less. We didn't, it didn't go up. It actually went down. It should have gone down another 25%. <laughs> I want to. the emergency order, correct? You know. Yeah, it should Or is have. these numbers already counting that 25% reduction in building? Oh, yeah, this includes the 25%. Thank you very yes, much. I'm sorry, yes. The only thing so, that I can you suggest. You're saying that 3875 <laughs> is the 25% reduction? The, already taken and factored, yes. Yes, all these fees Are include the reduction. Are you kidding me? So you're saying that from this point for, uh, before COVID, at 120 square foot shed, people were paying more than $38.75? Yes. It's probably 50. That completely yeah, it was, it flies on the face bucks, of what we were yeah. discussing. I... The way I'm seeing it and after hearing your discussion, I agree with you. There is a huge difference between a 120-foot shed or less compared to 121 square foot to 200. There's a huge difference. And I know because I have a 10 by 20 shed 
in my yard and I understand why it would require the inspections and plans reviews because it, it's a structure. Yes. It, it is a structure. <laughs> It does not have a concrete slab. It has the tie downs, tie which then becomes its own foundation. Yes. Okay. The only problem I'm seeing is forgetting about the right of way use permit because that was resolved when we approved the ordinance. Okay. So that's taken care of. Okay. But I'm looking at your little chart, uh, the permit fee breakdown. I think the wording needs to get changed and, and hear me out. Okay. It says prefab shed less than 120 square feet. Fine. It should say 120 square feet or less. Correct. It says less than or equal to the one I'm looking at. Well, mine just has a little less than on it. Yep. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> that one's okay. All right. Oh, yeah. So then the next line says prefab shed 120 to 199 square feet. And that should say 121 to 200 which goes back to my comment, you cannot have a shed that's 199 square feet because mm -hmm. they're made 10 by 20, yeah. 8 the, by 10. That's the easy fix I mentioned a minute ago. We just changed that. Thank you. <laughs> so at 201, that's when the right-of-way use... 201 is when the right-of-way use permit kicks in because right. that is a larger shed than 10 by 20. Can I which, ask a question? The right-of-way use permit, what if someone wants to put it in their right-of-way? They can't, right? Okay. So the right-of-way use permit is merely to cross over the right-of-way. With that big equipment that has to go across the right-of-way. What big equipment? It's a damn trailer. Did you not see the, what is it, 25 by 25 shit I got in beside my house? Like, it, it's a trailer. I don't even know where you like, live. I don't know how it got delivered. Well, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Miss Julie. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Juliana Belia, a public works director. It's not just to go across the right of way. That's, Thank you. That's one thing, but it's also to make sure the lot is properly graded and prepared so it drains correctly once the shed is built. So that's the other thing we have to check. So, okay. And I agree with All that right. for over it's 200 goes square feet. Yeah. Goes to the runoff. Yes, so I think the easy fix from what oh. I'm hearing, and I don't know if everybody else is in agreement, we just need to change the, the, the ordinance that we approved is fine. It's this chart, um, this chart that you have. I and disagree. if we need to revise the ordinance or resolution to reflect what's in the chart based on what we are we intended, then we can do that. First of all, the chart is not poly, it's not, not something not, that the commission's approved. Exactly. So, so we need to bring back the fee schedule pertaining to the shed permitting and inspection fees, and we need to bring back ordinance 2019-1 to alter the requirements, period. That's what we need to do. 19-1. It was the last one where it was approved. But that's the right of way. Yep. It's oh, only yeah. the right of way. This, this excuse doesn't me. have anything but the right of way. Mayor, you, you are correct. This is in the right of way section of the code. This has nothing to do with the building construction section. That would be a different section of the city code that we would have to amend. Not this particular section. So, so are this, you ordinance saying is, this ordinance is fine as written to change requirements for the building code. So are you saying when we did the resolution? No, are it's you, an ordinance. Yes, but 2018. R28. 28 is yes. where we put the... Um, Took out that $50. That, hold on, hold on. That, that resolution, however... That was a temporary measure. Thank you. That was only a temporary measure because we wanted to stop charging the money until we could prepare the ordinance. Okay. Then what we did was we prepared the ordinance, but that's specific to right of right See, away area and road drainage. Direction. That that is not the correct section of that's the code the that you'd have to change for the building code. That's a different section. That's right. So that and we specifically asked. We specifically asked. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hopkins, now I remember. As I recall, what you did ask is during the budget process, 
when we did when the fees were revised, mm -hmm. if they could look at that. Mm -mm. Exactly what no, we're we talking said we about. Would change it when the fees when and the that fees, did yeah, not happen. That you wanted them to take a look at it, to, to finite it to see what was really necessary and all that. There was or if no it could be reduced. Taking a look at it actually. Yeah. Okay, it was, so let's let's move on. I think we all understand what we're looking for. And it sounds like well, it's just a change to the fee schedule as far as reflecting the amounts based on the square footage to okay. make sure that those square footages include up from 121 to 200 I, and anything less than 120. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to reiterate that I don't feel comfortable doing this until the city, the other two commissioners are here once but again. We have the and number 1 this is not the direction that we made in 2018 or 2019. This is not this man's fault. I'm not I, we need a true conversation. We need to know the exact process that's being had that we don't have any control of. That's number one. We need to know exactly where these codes lie that need to be, because obviously we were told one thing, and it's completely different from that. So we need to know exactly where the codes lie that deal with sheds, what sections need to be amended, and what they have to do with. And you may think that you know exactly what you're talking about, but I'm going to tell you right now, we all thought we knew what it was that was supposed to be amended the last time we talked about this in 2018, and obviously that was wrong. I fully understood what we did in 2018 by removing oh. the right-of-way use permit. And Watch that's the meeting. What we did. Watch the um, meeting. City attorney, is there a code that we would need? I'm sorry. Is there a ordinance or a resolution that we would need to redo to capture the sheds from 121 to 200? So, no, ma'am. First of all, there's no ordinance that you need to redo. You have an ordinance amending the code. If you want to further amend the code, that would be a new ordinance. But what code, what code specifically deals with the building fees that we're discussing today with the sizes? What code is that in our ULDC? There is no code. We're talking no. about a standard operating policy and procedure. Thank you. So, again, you, it was just created a standard operating procedure that Based flew on, on the face of what this commission decided. The, the difference with the standard operating procedure and the square footage is, is as Anthony explained when he building first got code. here, was is the, is the building code. The building code. And that's where that comes from. Um, but, but it all is... Yet again, we were just told, not only during this, but also in the presentation, that the building code is interpreted by the local authority. So therefore, this local authority interpreted it differently. City Attorney, would it be best to have a policy enacted showing that for sheds under the two, 200 square feet or under, does not, we already know does not have a right-of-way use permit? I don't know if we have... Can I ask for a clarification on what it is that you're exactly looking for for those ones that are 200 or less? Because I'm, I'm a little... Anyone lost. that's 200 or less should come in take their survey, this is where it goes, here, now, what our new building manager is saying is that a 10 by 20 is a little bit large to do that. I'm all for that, to change it. 10 by 20, yes, you actually might have to go inspect and make sure you got tie downs and then it's not in the right way. I'm all right with that, okay? That, I'm okay and willing to pay the $38.75. But for anything that's on a 120 and under, you shouldn't be paying anything. So then you, at that, at that point, then no, a permit at all wouldn't be required. But according to uh, our presentation, a permit was the law for any shed. Okay, so, okay, so even on that presentation, even on that presentation, if you pull a permit, there's going to be fees involved. We know. <laughs> we know. That was the whole point. Florida Building Code requires us to pull a permit for a shed 120 or under. Mm -mm. I'm going to say indirectly, you can go to the Department of Community Affairs, and they're going to... Who's actually, that? Hold on, give me a moment. I'm sorry, who's <laughs> Department of Community Affairs? I read it earlier. The state agency. Shed oh, okay. kits developed okay. at large home improvement centers may not comply with the Florida Building Code. Okay but come under local building department's jurisdiction. You gotta keep it the way it is. 
Now, that is not specifically stated in the Florida Building Code. This is the, stated in the De Florida Department of Community Affairs. And that's their interpretation of the Florida Code, basically. Vice Mayor, go ahead. Uh, I, I would um, like to have this come back, you know, when we do have all commissioners so that this discussion and everybody's intent can get on the same page because at this point it's not uh back when it was brought up by linda yates she had to go through mm -hmm. this the intent was different i think in the minds probably because we didn't understand what was going on uh, i know i thought a hundred and or a, a 10 by 20 was really large for runoff and everything mm -hmm. and so i wasn't for that large of a, a building, but the majority agreed that 200 foot and less. And what I was remembering was what you have for the 120 and less, we made that the 200 and less Correct. option. Correct. Now, do I see personally the difference between the two? Oh yeah, I did in that original meeting. So I don't have a problem with the way that it's set up currently, uh, but I think it needs to be a further discussion with all commissioners so that we're all educated, we're all on the same page, and we go out into the community, all, everybody stating the same consistent message because we're stating what our intent was. And our intent isn't what's being done, you know, so, Basically, we look like we're telling falsehoods, but we're just trying to communicate our intent. So I would like to see this come back on a further agenda, but in the meantime, I would like to address the chart, the, the discrepancies, the inaccuracies of the chart, and get that changed to the uh, two areas, the NSS being uh, 120 square foot and less, yes. and your NSS1 being 121 to 200 square feet. Now I'd this, like to see that change right away. This chart is an internal policy, correct? Yes. That we have no ability to change, correct? Uh, SOPs, we don't really. That is that is um, theirs. But we still need to discuss it. But it, shouldn't so, it be consistent with our fee schedule? Yes. It, it, it needs to be corrected. We'll correct it. I mean, yeah, that's, it's that's, yeah, that's not. That's and, uh, and that, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that mm -hmm. would get this yeah. corrected. That would get this corrected. Anything else that's pushed out on the website needs to make sure that it you matches know, and it's, it's corrected. It's, it's, it's saying matches. the same thing that this yes. chart does. Okay. But then we need a further conversation with all commissioners so that everybody's on the same page with the up to, you know, less than 120 and 121 to 200. Make sure we're on the same page with that. Does I'm that going make to sense? make a motion. Move to bring back the um, fee schedule pertaining to the sheds and permitting and inspection fees associated with sheds, obviously. Second. We'll start with that one. Second. Uh, for, and it, okay. Why are we bringing it back to possibly do what? amend? To possibly amend. This way, it gives us the ability right. to discuss and change if need be. Because so you, you don't repeat what we just did with two other commissioners. Because they're under. Well, Commissioner Emmerich wasn't even here at that. Point. Yes, he was in 2019. Yeah. So yes, two other people are under that same impression mm -hmm. that we were. And so, yeah, I, I definitely think we need to um, have that discussion. Not only that, that this this. Okay, actually, I got a motion on the floor. Hold yeah, on, you hold got on. a second. I got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Carrison, seconded by Vice Mayor. Anything to that, Commissioner Carrison? Yes, it was actually you who talked about how the fee schedule had to be changed, and it wasn't. Okay, that so meeting. that is why. Bringing that fee schedule back is imperative because that whole con what was it called? Oh, convenience charge 
was one of uh, your My points of contention, <laughs> and <laughs> we never addressed it. Right. So that also has to be included in that entire book of what it is that yeah. these fees are for. All right. And um, so that's it for that one, and then I'll go to okay. the next one. Anything, Vice Mayor? Uh, and the reason the fee schedule and discussion has to come back is because commission does not set SOP for staff. Right. And so we cannot dictate to them how they're going to write their SOP, but when we talk about fee schedule, we can then have talk with them so that I see city attorney frowning. Did I state something incorrect? <laughs> No, but I'm just thinking, I mean, it depends on how this, the fee schedule is written and these specific fees. If these are in the fee schedule and they're specific to sheds, that might be the case. But, y you know, you're, you don't really want your fee schedule to be legislation. You want it just to be, you know, what the fee name is and what the fee amount is. So that's what I need. And this is why sure. this is why if you look at Ordinance 2019, whatever, the one that's on the back up here, you see that we struck that from the fee schedule and put it into the code. Because that's really not an appropriate, you don't really utilize the fee schedule to amend the legislation, you know, of the code. So it, depending on what you all want to oh, do, then we one. have to figure out the, the right vehicle. It might not be to change the fee schedule. It, it, it might be depending on what the different fees look like and what they apply to. Which, all right, so that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to do is have the fee schedule in front of us also the code in front of us for a possible amendment so that one will follow the other direction we don't have this problem again yeah i think part of the reason this is confusing is i think that we do not it's not as simple as saying oh the shed fee is you know this much for this size shed and this much more for that size shed it's that you have these six or seven fees all cumulative and that's Bingo. how they come up with the total which is part of my next all right so we have a motion on the floor <laughs> call a question um Commissioner Carrison? Yes. Vice Mayor? Yes. And I'm a yes, thank you. And you said you have another motion, yes. Commissioner Carrison? Um, so, uh, first I gotta ask the city attorney, so would it be appropriate to bring back ordinance number 2019-01, or do we, what do we do as far as addressing um, the 10 by 20s and the 120 and the differential and and the process what do we do there well it depends on what you all want to do we have to figure so, out what the policy is and then and then we determine the vehicle okay. but we would never bring back an ordinance to amend it that's just, the ordinance is just the vehicle for amending the code language if you want the code language amended then we bring you a new ordinance with a new code language in it okay so bring back uh move to bring back an ordinance that reflects that any 200 square foot or less shed, wait, um, bring back an ordinance, ordinance, right, to reflect that any 200 square foot shed that is up to 120 feet, no, I got to reverse that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll get it. I'll get it right. <laughs> All right. Move to have any 121 square foot shed up to 200 square feet uh, be required to have a inspection by the building department uh, for right of way use. Side down. And uh, be it constructed or not, that's the difference. And then any 120 square foot or less not require a permit fee or permit or inspection. So it's essentially what they're doing versus uh, removing the fee for anything that's under 120. You capture the motion? No. You want me to re you want me to re try to rephrase it? We have to be close to it? They got it. You want me to try to rephrase it? 
I'm that's, talking to the commission, That's fine. Guys. The, the okay. reason I won't second I'm, it I'm is because this it. is discussion that I want to have with the whole crew right. here. And at that point in time, I think we can ask if we want an ordinance change rather than asking for an ordinance to come back before the discussion is done. They already said they're going to correct the chart so that what you were talking about, that up to, uh, you know, or 120 and less than then 121 to 200 is going to be corrected automatically, correct? We don't have to give you any oh. consensus. You're just going to correct it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop, but stop, that's not stop. True. We have a motion on the floor. They will capture it by listening to the recording. Do I hear a second? No. Hearing no second, the motion dies. Can I, so as I understand it, though, what's being done now is not what the commission directed. And here is what my concern is. This began in December of 2018. I'm sorry, November of 2018, really. It didn't get completed until, what, a year and a half later? But I already asked, do we have a code that regulates the size of shed and what we do for the building department? And he said it's through the Florida Building Code. He said the Florida Building Code can be amended locally. Correct. That's so, correct. But they're doing it. What you? Uh, how do I, I'm going to say that's. I'm going to say that's correct. But I'm also going to say it's based on my interpretation to present to you guys. And I get that. But, okay. But and you've already made it clear <laughs> that a ten by twenty requires the inspection. I'm trying to get clarification be it in code, be it in resolution, however the heck we want it, so that our intent is in writing. Thank you. Beyond and, uh, the standard operation procedure. Which Thank the standard you. operation procedure is completely opposite of what the direction of the commission was. So I don't know where that's coming from. So Commissioner Kirsten, if I may, what I would suggest is just tell us what you want and let us bring the suggestion back to you as to how to accomplish that. It, ding, ding. It, it could be putting language into the code related to sheds. If we determine that that's not necessary because of what's in the Florida building code, it could just be a resolution that expresses that so we don't have to rely on the minutes. Okay, but, that's what but I was trying to do. Rather than focusing on like how do we do it, let's figure out what is it that you want to do because I hear you saying that you don't believe that what was done reflects the intent. But maybe if you just clarify the intent and tie that into your motion, so, then we can bring something back to you to consider and shape or reshape. Which is exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to give you an intent that was actually kind of part and parcel to what our building department is saying should be done, okay? However, once it's put on, it can be amended. And so if the intent changes when our full board is here and they say, no, 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 we believe a 200 square foot or less does not require a permit, period. Doesn't require inspection, period. It can be amended at that time to reflect that. Or maybe they turn around and say, no, this doesn't work either. We believe all sheds require a permit. So I was trying to get some sort of foundation baseline, which was based off of what we just discussed, yes. so that it can be brought before us so we're not coming and having a discussion to have a discussion to have a discussion to have a draft then have another discussion then have an ordinance then a resolution another discussion and finally in two years the add, actual can I add completion. To, can I comment on that? I'm understanding where you were going now. You're trying to get ahead of the game. And so with now what I understand too. I, so what the uh, city attorney has suggested maybe we should give them our intent is to bring back something to reflect. I don't know what, what that is. It's not even in my backup, so. Uh, well, it's exactly what um, Mr. Warren has stated that is going on, and if they bring that back, then we can change it as we want to when the full board's here. Okay, so then the motion would be to bring back what it is that is the current standard of operation procedure, right? Yeah. No. What do you want me to say? Just, Just tell, tell us me. what you want to bring back something that 
what? Uh, that reflects what he said. There you go. How about I try this? I'll pass. We can turn around and change so, so it, right? The language says, bring back something that for sheds 120 square feet, unless you don't need this. <laughs> yeah, but instead of saying an ordinance that says this or whatever that says that, because we've got to look at that. Well, That's we, what I just said, though. I'm I not said, in charge of seconding listen, your motions. Listen, how about I try? Let, 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 her, let her finish, because she started there. Go ahead. Move to allow a ordinance. Whatever. Or resolution. What a, or resolution to come back to the commission that is based off of a 120 square foot shed to 200 square foot shed uh, requiring a permit and inspection, right, by the building department. That anything from 120 square foot or less would not require a permit or no. would not require an inspection. I'll second that. Or plan review by the building department. Right. Or plan review by the <laughs> building department. Yeah. Okay, got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Carison, seconded mm -hmm. by Vice Mayor Commissioner Carison. Um, I was attempting to do what you said and bring it back so that we had a starting point. And if we amend it at that time, we won't have a problem advertising it or re-advertising it or uh, that's what I'm trying to do. So I thought I did that in the first place, but apparently I'm brain dead at this point. So Vice Mayor, anything? Uh, basically what she stated was bringing back something that does show what's going on currently. So um, I'm definitely for that. And then that can be a springboard or it can be an agreement when we're all together. So thank you. All right. So we have motion seconded and no further discussion. Let's call the question. Uh, Commissioner Carison. Yes. Vice Mayor. Yes. And I'm a yes. Thank you. Now, all right, one more thing and I'm done. Consensus to have the building department as well as the road and drainage department bring back the procedures that they are utilizing now for any shed uh, and to delineate the sizes. But right? your staff. Sorry. So, well, the because reason why I put the two out. of them. Because you left one out. Zoning. <laughs> okay, yeah. But isn't my, that what you did with your first motion? No. Mm -hmm. Here's what my my problem is, is we took road and drainage out of that. Of no, I would include that. I just want to make you sure that we include everybody. No, needs. you're right. You're right. But we, we took road and drainage out when we did that one ordinance. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at is we need to know what all three depart any departments do uh, during the shed process currently, what they did previously. Um, we need to know what those processes are, what is their actually wor actual workflow chart, and this way we know exactly who's doing what. Is there anything that's, you know, the same, or are we just shifting the work from road and drainage department to zoning department, you know what I mean? And now zoning gets paid versus the district. Uh, that's that's where I'm going with that. Yep. Okay. That's why I go with staff. Okay, staff. But I for the entire process. On that, we can just have a consensus that's that what you I bring for. back. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. We've we've been asking for workflows between departments for many years now. And, and this, because there seems to be a lot of duplication between departments, if you've got one department going out to do an inspection, it, it, I, we've been just asking for workflows for a very long time. And um, it, but it educates us. We don't know. I mean, we're not in that department doing everything. So by showing us and teaching us, we have a greater understanding. Well, again, the only reason why I mentioned road and drainage is because we took them out of the exactly. slip, out of yeah. the, the process earlier. And, and staff does the touch sheds. I mean, the edification, education would be good for us. 
Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All righty, we've got nothing else except for Don't you dare. communicate uh, public comment. Any public comment? Nothing? No public comment. Oh, right. so let's move on to commission communications. Uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, two real quick ones. I, I just wanted uh, people, I, I don't know what all is going on with Venice graduation, but I do know Northport, uh, the high school, is having three days worth where the kids can walk the stage and actually get their uh, diploma. So I didn't want everybody to think that, you know, they're, they're being left out or their high school is not thinking about them. And the fireworks, I have come to learn that um, these home fireworks, the state put something out telling homeowners they can shoot off and get all the fireworks they want and stuff. But we can still regulate. But we, they did not preempt us from being able to regulate our own city. So that was something that I learned. So, good luck, police department, on July fourth. <laughs> and fire department. We don't. We don't have a regulation on that. Well. Yeah, we do. And no fireworks. <laughs> kind. Yeah, trying to it's, force it. it's illegal in our city, so yeah. they can be dispatched. But they have to see it and. Yeah, exactly. Kind of. Exactly. <laughs> Anything else, Vice Mayor? That's it. Commissioner Carson. Um, I appreciate you mentioning the, the graduation. Uh, as I understand it, it will be a, a graduate walking across the uh, stage at the theater and getting their diploma. They'll get a picture, and then they're going to go... Uh, nobody around um, other than, you know, the parent that drives them there. And then later on, they will take that and accumulate all those students and do some sort of a video thing that will play. And so there's no real. Um, well, I had told. And it's just family. The, and I it's wasn't said just the principal. one thing. It was family um, mm. that was going in. So. So but I, I didn't want them to think that the school had, you know, wasn't caring about the students because they do. They, well, they truly I don't. Do. I don't necessarily think that the uh, school doesn't care about the students. I think that um, they could have come up with a more creative way of creating a celebration that would um, that would do both. And that's, I mean, Pineview did it, and there's other schools all over the state that's done it. Uh, found ways to have a graduation ceremony that was, uh, you know, worthy of, of their achievements, that it wasn't just walking into a stage with nobody there but your principal and vice principal, possibly, and, and walking away. So that's my thought, of course. Nobody else has put that thought in my mind. Let's not go there. But, um, that's, I mean, that, you know, that, that's no problem. And it, it wasn't the school's fault that it was canceled because they, no, it a, was not. They had a big shebang out at Atlanta Braves Stadium planned. Correct. And then it was just, it was, cut. it was so. Chuck Henry who made the decision that nobody that was under a roof could have a, a graduation ceremony which then the school board administration right. decided that that means nobody gets a graduation, exactly. One doesn't which was take, you know. two high schools that were going to have an indoor graduation. So completely unfair. Now, then we, the group that's trying to figure out this alternative graduation did have the high school's um, field reserved, ready to go, but the principal chose to say well, absolutely not. Let's just do it so, this way, guys. It's a school board, school kind of thing. It really isn't no, the city it, of Northport. It is the city of Northport I, because the it citizens... It doesn't really involve well, us. Is my comment board. last yeah. time I checked. So... Um, well, I'm trying to... Now you're trying to reel in it? No, I'm trying to keep it relative to the city oh. of Northport. Well... That's all. We... Just had the discussion about how what's happening. Oh, so you know, kind of like um, relative to the. Okay. Um, so, anyways, the bottom line is is that 
this group, this this group that came together, which was actually inspired by the uh, the students who wanted to to see it done, and then furthered with some of the parents and grandparents, uh, now has civic organizations, government entities, uh, government officials. Um, also, uh, some of the uh, just general organizations, local businesses, uh, all uh, students from all shapes and sizes, not even just the, the Northport High students. There's going to be more students involved in the planning and volunteering. And so this is a huge community undertaking that was actually inspired by students. And I got to tell you, yeah. I am so proud of our there, students. There is absolutely so nothing wrong with it. Absolutely yep. nothing. So proud. And, and the, the principal of the high school doesn't take away from it. He's grateful for it. You know, kids well, can go to both. I won't go there. I won't push it that far. But anyways, I think he could have been a little bit more um, helpful. So there's that. Anything else, Commissioner Carson? Um, well, I think I, uh, that was exactly what I was going to say is that, um, you know, I think that we could have had some creative thinking and some organization amongst our high school. I don't, I didn't expect anything different. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, uh, I think that this is going to be a grand, uh, way of trying to celebrate our students and their achievements. And, um, I think they deserve it and it, it's devil's in the details, of course. It's, it's about making sure that there's social distancing, there's, uh, there's uh, sanitization going on, and that, you know, it's limited persons, and it's not going to be a, you know, a festival, um, but to give them something that's a little bit more than just a video at the end of the year. So that's, um, yeah, that's about it. Anything else? I don't know. I'm just going to be quiet from now on because I'm just getting pissed now. <laughs> All right. So I have I have two that are kind of related. Um, city manager, we're still under a state of emergency, correct? We got the... Any idea when that's going to end? <laughs> I mean, is there a re... No, I'm serious. I, is COVID ever going to end? I don't know. Do we have to stay under a state of emergency? It's been, what, 15 weeks, maybe longer? 17. <laughs> Do, what, what is the purpose at this point in time of still being under a state of emergency? Meaning eligible for federal funding and funding from the county that is now starting to come out, CARES Act funding. That I, I actually spoke to the county administrators the other day because I was considering ending it, and we discussed the things that we would lose eligibility for if we ended it. So as you'll notice, you've noticed I've ended pieces of it. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, this. Right. Um, so we're ending the pieces we can while still making sure that we're eligible for the money that we can get. And as soon as we can end it, I've said it before, you've heard me publicly state it many times, nobody wants this more than I do to end. Um, but I can't give up the opportunity for federal funding nope. just to and, save and a I, few bucks on overtime that's really not as, you know, the outgo going is not as big as the incoming loss that we'd get if we ended it right now. And, and I appreciate that because I didn't know there was still funding coming, funneling through down to us. So I yes, appreciate the, that. The county, um, and if you all may have seen some of the things because it was put out there, the county just got um, CARES money, which I think actually the chamber may even have sent the email out about it. They are trying to figure out how to dis how to distribute that and who can qualify for what, and it's a large chunk of money. We don't know what the cities will get, um, but mm -hmm. I don't want to lose it. Of course, because it's. I mean, they got I think like four million dollars or something. So even if we got half a million dollars, it's worth staying open. Gotcha. I just I just wanted to double check t to find out the exact reason because COVID doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. Ever. So it's probably the new flu. I don't I, know. I don't know. Can I jump um, off of that because of the National League of Cities call ahead. that I had today? They did talk about more funding coming down for the municipal governments and, and through the county. So 
that may no go homes. up. Yeah. yeah it's, it's an opportunity. Yep. Remind Mr. Lewis what city he lives in. <laughs> no, actually, I'm not going to do that. Well, no. Yeah, because that might, you know. Because it's changed. <laughs> oh, it changed? Yes. He moved. Oh, he didn't know that he moved. Yes, he, he no longer lives in a city. Ah, gotcha. Okay. All right, so my next question is, we allowed online public comment during the state of emergency um, when Chambers was closed and we held our Zoom and our hybrid meetings. There are still a lot of citizens that are very fearful to come into this. And I would really like to get a consensus to extend public comment. If it's possible, city attorney might have to weigh in to extend public comment um, to be able to be online during the state of emergency um, and possibly looking at ways we can continue it forever. Because we've already found that online public comment works when it works. Um, <laughs> it works when it works because it's technology. Um, why, why do away with that aspect? And we may have to amend our meeting procedures. We may have to amend our little cards. So city you could, attorney. Yeah, the, the city code has language in it that would preclude us from, mm -hmm. from doing that without a code amendment. Now that being said, you can direct the city manager. He can issue an emergency order that specifies that. The emergency order that we had in place said no in-person attendance, no in-person public comment, and right. the city manager will publish something um, with alternative ways to watch and comment, and that's what he did. So when that order was was terminated, then, right. you know, then we don't have anything. Right, because it was all tied together. It, it was in a nice, tight bow. I just want to see about getting a consensus to allow public comment to be heard online or through the phone. I don't even know how many people took advantage of it through the phone. You know, we did this two and a half, three years ago when we asked for this all to come back and we talked about FaceTime or Facebook Live. We talked about some sort of software. We talked all about this to come back. You guys talked about that when you first came on. Yes. And I think it was even before I came on. Yes. That first six so, months, you guys talked about I, technology I, and mm -hmm. yeah, I, I do remember that too. Um, so but I think the question is, if you want, to, if you want to take a consensus about that, do you want that just to continue during the emergency, or are you looking for something <coughs> to be long term? Well, right now, the quickest way we can reinstate online um, public comment and telephone is to direct city manager to create an emergency ordinance as directed by commission to reinstate online and telephone. Can I get a consensus for that? I don't think we need an order. I think she meant emergency order. 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 Emergency okay. order. I apologize. Okay. Emergency order. I apologize. Yes. 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 Okay. So I would also like to see about amending our code, our administrative code, to allow um, online public comment to be heard with or without COVID, however that looks. <laughs> following the guidelines that we've had with the hours, you know, you have to submit such and such within so many hours. I'm okay right. with that, the way but that, there has to be a... The way we have been doing it lately is what you'd like to see. we've been doing it, and I don't know how she would need to do that to fit our code to carry this forward with or without COVID. Yeah. You just give us, give us a shot at doing it. And yeah. 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 So we can do an order and then follow that with an, with an ordinance. And... Uh, just as a final thought, did you want to keep both methods? Just the reason that we had two methods. Was well, because we don't have a lot of places that have internet. Amen to that. Well, also because you need to, uh, you know, some people may not have computers or access to that, so you need to provide something else. But if we're having regular public comment as well, you don't have that legal pressure, you may still want to do it from a policy perspective. Yeah. So, so you want both? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, yes. Commissioner Carrison. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So there you go. And we'll we'll review the documents when you bring it back and and tweak it and go from there. So, alrighty. Thank you very much. That's all the public comment that I have, guys. Um, and thank you very much for hearing that because I think it is something that's still vitally important. Um, administrative comments. Miss Laura. Have a happy 4th of July weekend. Thank you. Uh, city Attorney. Nothing, Mayor. And City Manager. 
We're just looking forward to the 4th of July. Um, you know, we're catching both ends of that. Mm -hmm. We're the only ones doing it, so there's we get yeah. the pros and the cons. Yeah, but I heard. So, yes, you they did. All the tickets? Yeah, all the parking passes are all sold out. I, I saw. believe they have been. Yeah, I saw it online. So, yeah. It's going to be a great event, and look forward we're to seeing you all something. there. We're doing something. We're doing something as doing the best, best we as can. we can. Absolutely. So with that, it Very is now to graduation. 539 and I want to wish everybody a happy and safe 4th of July and thank you very much. We are adjourned.